Welcome to Next on the Tee with Chris Mascaro, where tour players, legends, and the top instructors in the game share their stories, insights, and playing lessons. Join Chris every week as he talks with the greats of the game. You are the smartest guy I've spoken to on radio or television in my career. And Chris, again, you are, you're knocking out of the park. You're like eight under par in this interview. By having any research, I'm hiring your tail to be the research, man. You're the best. You're a fantastic host and tremendously respected in the golf community. And- yeah, Chris, you do an amazing job, and your listeners are super lucky to have you, and it's always my pleasure. Chris Scarrow is the king of the golf podcast. Don't miss him on Tuesdays. Now, here's your host, Chris Mascaro. Hello, folks, and thank you for coming back and joining me this week on Next on the T. I'm your host, Chris Mascaro. I hope you're having a fantastic week so far. I can tell you how excited I am about this week's guest lineup. Plus, I get the honor of spending the next couple of hours with all of you. Can't get any better than this. Leading off this week's show is a wonderful friend from over on the football side, and that is former Rams Pro Bowl quarterback Jim Everett. Jim has been a regular guest with us over on Thursday Night Tailgate for going on 12 years now. His insights and knowledge of the game are absolutely fantastic. So you know I got to get his thoughts on the Steelers quarterback situation and the upcoming draft. Plus, he's always been a big supporter of Jared Goff, so we'll talk about that Rams-Lions playoff game. He is also a really good golfer, a single-digit handicap during his playing time out in L.A., We'll talk about that and some of his favorite events that he got to be a part of back when he was playing in the 80s and the 90s out there in California. Looking forward to having Jimmy as part of the show. He'll join me here in just a few moments. Following him, I'm going to get a return visitor from 2014 Georgia PGA Teacher of the Year, Kevin Roman. I'm going to talk to Kevin tonight about things that we need to know before we go out and buy new equipment. First of all, is the golf ball that our favorite tour player is playing. Is that the right one for us? If it's good for him or her, is it really going to be good for us too? We'll find out how to know. Then we'll get into determining the right bounce for our wedges because different turf conditions in different parts of the country is going to require a different degree of bounce. We'll also talk about driver shafts because buying a driver off the rack can limit your success with that driver. I know because it happened to me. Looking forward to spending some time with Kevin. He's fantastic. He'll join me about 25 minutes from now. Following him, I'll be joined by another great friend of the show, and that is Russ Holden. You've heard me talk for years about the great things that Russ has done for our military veterans through his Caddy for a Cure program. Well, he's building on that success and his passion for giving back with a new organization called Inspiring Warriors Golf. If you're a veteran or you know one, this is going to be an important segment for you. Russ will join me about 45 minutes from now. And then we're going to round things out with a visit from Tammy Mayfair, Billy Mayfair's lovely wife. Tammy has had a brilliant career in her own right in and around the game, going back to when she started playing at the age of five. She had a tremendous junior golf career, which culminated with her being inducted into her local Edmonds, Oklahoma Junior Golf Hall of Fame. She was a part of a fantastic Arizona State women's golf team back in the early 90s. She went on to have a successful career on the broadcast side of golf. Then she and Billy got married, and now she's working with him and others dealing with autism. It's an amazing story of how she figured out that Billy might be on the autism spectrum, something no one ever diagnosed him with, and she figured it out when Billy was around 50 years of age. Wait until you hear this story and things I never knew about autism. So informative. Tammy's going to join me about an hour from now. So it's going to be a really fun and informative show this week here on Next on the T. But as always, thank you all so much for tuning in and taking the journey with me this week. Before we get started, and like I've been saying to you guys for the last several months, our resident director of instruction, Tom Patry, and I have been working with a company called Kickpoint. And they have done some magical things with our logos and created some polo shirts with some wonderful designs where they take our logos and turn them into designs on a polo shirt, they're absolutely outstanding. Kickpoint Golf is a private label custom golf apparel company making bespoke polo shirts, quarter zips, and hoodies for those selected clubs looking to take their branded game to a whole new level. If you want to check out their apparel, and again, 
It's going to knock your socks off. Send an email to info at kickpointgolf.com. They'll get right back to you. There's no middleman. They're going to go right to the guys that do this work. You're going to check it out, and you are really going to love what they do. I'm going to start showing the uh, polo shirts that they designed for me on my Instagram, at CT Mascaro. Check them out there so you can get a sample of what they look like. These guys know where it's at. Now let's talk about golf getaways and buddies trip locations. When you're thinking about that, think about our friends over at the McLemore which is a wonderful resort located just south of Chattanooga, Tennessee, high atop Lookout Mountain. It is a casual two-hour drive from Atlanta, Nashville, and Birmingham. The existing Highlands course is now ranked in the top 100 courses you can play in the U.S. by Golf Digest. The 18th hole is ranked in the top 10 finishing holes in the world. A second course, the Keep, is under construction and will open summer of 2024. The Keep is a Bill Bergen Reese Jones design and features a mile and a half of dramatic cliff edge, with every inch of that edge filled up with a golf hole. A world class hotel, Cloudland Lookout Mountain Curio Collection by Hilton, will open spring of 2024. Both have incredible views into historic McLemore Cove, 1,200 feet below. You got to see it to believe it, folks. Stay. Dine and play golf above the clouds at McLemore. Go online to McLemore.com to book your stay and play package. Now let's talk about the new P790 irons from TaylorMade. From the very beginning, P790 irons have been rooted in clean aesthetics and thoughtful design. However, their true beauty is found beneath the surface. With AI-optimized weighting and speed foam air on the inside, every iron is uniquely designed to perform exactly how you need it to. As striking as they are on the outside, their true beauty lies within. Learn more about the new P790 irons from TaylorMade by checking out their website at TaylorMadeGolf.com. All right, now joining me for the first time here on Next on the Tee, but a longtime guest over on the football side on our show Thursday Night Tailgate is Jim Everett. Jim has been a wonderful friend going on 12 years now. He's also the first guest who we ha- struck a little fear in our hearts when we unmuted his microphone because you just never know what Jim might say, but we are so grateful to him and for him and for the great things that he's done for us over the years. As a quarterback, he still ranks eighth all time at Purdue in passing yards and touchdowns. With the Rams, he's number one all time in both of those categories. His knowledge and insights of the game are the best I've ever heard. I can't believe he's not calling games for either one of the networks or for some team somewhere. Selfishly, I wish it was with the Steelers. As a person, he's second to none, and it's great having him with me this week here on Next on the T. Hey, Jim, how are you, my friend? Chris, I'm telling you, man, I feel like I got the podium right now, but it's like you've already warned everybody that I might, might just go off. I mean, it's, <laughs> I won't even surprise them. I kind of like the shock factor a little bit, but I think that's out right now. But, Indeed. But uh, definitely, uh, you know, I do a little work for uh, CBS and ABC around here on, on local L.A. stuff, but yeah, if there were there was opportunities to do stuff i would i would absolutely enjoy enjoy talking about this game of football because i absolutely love it it's yeah. uh and How i thought this year was fabulous by the way it was yep i'm sure it was it was a lot more fabulous for you in la than it was for me in pittsburgh even though we pulled it out at the end but uh yeah, yeah. your rams really good well i mean whenever you're getting rid of, like you look at a pittsburgh and you're getting rid of your offense coordinator and you've got question marks at your quarterback and you've got i mean that just doesn't bode well for you know um going and playing in the final game of the season you know what i'm saying that's that you've got too many question marks going on and i think with kenny if you want to get to it yeah i think there were some question marks about him coming into the league you know was he the guy i think coach was familiar with him being right there at pittsburgh i think there was some you know some comfortable enough but was he the you know, first round guy, you know, you see Brock Purdy playing in the, in the, in the bowl game and he's a, you know, seventh rounder. Um, you would hope that Kenny could be Patrick Mahomes, but then everybody's looking for Patrick Mahomes. And I think that's where Philippe Williams comes in. So, I mean, I, I, I don't know. I don't know where he's, I don't know what the future holds. I don't know what the offense is going to look like. Um, and that, that kind of, if you don't know what your offense is going to look like, it's hard to say, what kind of guy you need to run it. So let's talk about Kenny a little bit more though, because yep. when you came into the league, it took you a couple of years to kind of get your feet wet and get established and that sort of thing. Kenny has now had kind of a year and a half, obviously two years in the league. So 
talk about maturing as a quarterback from rookie year to now your second year and now looking ahead to your third year. Is it something that you could see that Kenny can still has an opportunity to be the guy or have we seen enough on video that we really need to question this thing? Well, I mean, I, I think it all, there's, there's some component to Kenny of how much does he want it? You know what I mean? As far as, you know, was, was Kenny's goal just to make it to the NFL or was Kenny's goal to be the number one guy in the NFL? There's a big different, you know, goal set on that part, but, I think he's got some tools. I think that if he takes advantage of them, um, he, you know, gets the strength up and and it does the type of type of stuff. I don't know again let, what system they're going to be running next year. Um, and I think you want some, like for example, look at Brock Purdy in the San Francisco system. You know that system is set up where he's got a lot of a lot of guys around him. And I don't know if, if Kenny is surrounded by guys like that. And that's, you know, that's part of the issue. So you need to, you need to have all the components around you. I think the Pittsburgh defense has, has spoken up, but I just don't see it. There are big play guys on offense showing up. If you're the Steelers OC, and we know we got a new one in Arthur Smith coming over, uh, mm-hmm. from, you know, he had success as, as a Titans offensive coordinator. So we, we got him. Coming in from Atlanta, his stint there here in Atlanta as the head coach. But yeah, uh, if you're the OC and you've seen what you've seen from Kenny, now we saw Mason Rudolph step up. He had never really been given a, a huge opportunity to be the yeah. starting quarterback, and and mm-hmm. they kind of threw him in there in desperation because things weren't going well with Trubisky either. But we saw mm-hmm. Mason Rudolph do some good things. Now he's a a, a free agent going into this off season. If you're the yep. OC, are you trying to convince? Mason Rudolph to stick around because you liked what you saw from him at the end of the season? Because if not, Kenny's the only quarterback on the roster, including the <laughs> practice squad. So you're going to have to bring somebody in. Now, maybe his guy is to bring in Ryan Tannehill, who he had success with with the Titans. I don't know. What, what, what direction are you going? Are you going draft? Or are you going bringing in some veteran quarterback to give Kenny some competition? Okay, so all these different components work down to Arthur Smith. Chris, we got to see what offense he wants to run. Now, Arthur Smith is known for his running game. I mean, he had the Derrick Henry type. He has the, uh, he didn't ask much from Tannehill down in Tennessee. They were, they were more run first. And I think that's, you know, what Pittsburgh would like to get to. They've got some good runners. They want to be run first. They want to be, um, they want to ground it out. So, I don't know if you're looking for that dynamic of a quarterback. So I think Kenny can serve that for sure. Um, if I'm comparing that to Tannehill, I take Kenny. That's just me. Um, but I, I, that's where I think he'll get it. But I, again, Arthur may have some you know feelings with Tannehill that he, that he likes, but I don't know if I, I do that. Maybe I bring a young guy in. There's so many young, talented quarterbacks in this draft. I'd be real surprised if teams that were – you know, have question marks at that position, wouldn't go out and grab one. Uh, Because there's going to be, I mean, where Penix goes, where where, uh, Bo Nix goes, where, I mean, there's where J.J. goes. Um, I don't even talking about May, Williams, and Daniels, the top three guys. So there's there's eight guys that I think can play. And if teams want to wait all the way around to maybe the second, maybe third round, I think you still get one of these guys. So speaking of the draft, Jim, and and the Steelers and Arthur Smith really wanting to lean heavy on the running game. And the Steelers have struggled with their left tackle. Their center wasn't the best at getting snaps back from the shotgun position. So as we look ahead to that draft, do you you like offensive line then to be the focus? Maybe you go second, third round, probably more third or fourth round with a quarterback. But do you go offensive line heavy? Does that make sure that Kenny has the time that he needs? That's a great question, Chris. And I, I think the people, you know, and I know, I know your show's being played in Pittsburgh. So one of the key things about the NFL, to advance to the big game, you have to be able to win in your division, okay? So you've got to look straight straight at Baltimore. What do we got to do to beat Baltimore? What do we got to do? Because they're the number one team. What do you got to do to beat, you know, Cincy? What do we got to do to um, beat Cleveland? And I think a lot of that has to do, I mean, I don't know what Harbaugh does over on, on, uh, over on the Ravens side, but 
you got to win in the trenches against that guy. You just got to. I mean, they've just got Lamar's too talented, the running game. And I know Gus the Bus is a free agent this year. So, but you got to win your division. So that's what I would look at first. How do we match up? Just for like for the Rams, they have to get through San Francisco. So they've got to match up. And they're big, finally matched up a little bit better this year, but still it was, you know, San Francisco was the dominant team, as was Baltimore. So, like I'm saying, just find the guy. If you think you need the, the offensive lineman to compete against Baltimore, you got to get him. Because you can look at uh, uh, Puka Nakua, fifth-round draft pick, and what he did behind, you know, with Stafford, who's a good quarterback. And he just let him up. So there's talent in this draft. You just have to know how to use it and what you're looking for. And that's the problem when you're having a new offensive coordinator trying to say, hey, I, you know, I've got to use this part or this part. I want this guy. And that's what Les Snead and, and um, McVay do so well together is, is he knows exactly what type of guy. And then Les goes out and finds him. Speaking of how to use it, the Steelers drafted Broderick Jones in the first round this last year, and they moved him over to right tackle. Moving a young lineman to a different side of the line of scrimmage doesn't always go well. Didn't go well for Kevin Dotson, who worked out great for your Rams when they put him <laughs> yeah, back to his you. natural position. <laughs> how big is that change for an O lineman to go from one side of the line to the other? Well, it is easier, I'm going to say, to go to the right side. For a right-handed, if you have a right-handed quarterback, it is easier from going from left tackle to right tackle. Um, I, right tackles going to left tackle is really, really tough. So, um, you know, a credit to, I mean, they're sat at the left side, and so they wanted to try to, you know, move him over the right side. It's a little bit easier. But, again, thanks for Dotson because this uh, Rams <laughs> offensive line would not have been what it was without Dotson for sure. So let's talk a little bit more Ram centric. And I, I know you were a big fan of Jared Goff. Mm -hmm. Talk about how bittersweet it was to see him prosper the last couple of years, particularly this year out in Detroit. Oh man. I think they've got one of the most talented rosters in the NFL and they're only building on it. They're, um, you know, what they, what the general manager is doing with that team is just really, really look good. I think that, you know, and I'll say this to you, Chris, in that championship game, I really think Detroit should advance. And I know Dan Campbell goes on on fourth down. I get it. But at some point in time, when you're playing for the championship, you got to kick those field goals. And when you lose a game by three points and you and you turn down two field goals, that kind of hurts. So I really thought they were they were going to be the team representing the NFC. Um, of course, the Chiefs represent the AFC. I mean, they're. Who bets against Patrick Mahomes? <laughs> the only guy I know is an idiot because I'm telling you, that dude just wins too much. I mean, he is freaking good. And with that receiving core, there's no doubt he re he gets MVP. I mean, seriously, that the receiving core for the Kansas City Chiefs needs an upgrade, and they still win a Super Bowl. It's unbelievable. So it was a tremendous game between the Lions and the Rams. Had to be tough emotionally for you to watch what Goff was doing and then what Stafford was doing, both played exceptionally well. Mm -hmm. Talk about what you saw in that game and what was it? Was there an internal struggle? Oh, I think it was just, you know, I think that uh, Detroit was so physical at, at the end of the day and, and you know, they got it. Um, um, I, but that's what, that's what Dan Campbell wants from his guy. I mean, they've got some good players, um, Gibbs in there. I really like the receiver Williams and he hasn't even, he hasn't even really hit his A game yet. So, um, so no, I just think there's a lot of talent on the Detroit side. Um, and I think that, you know, hopefully they can get some new uniforms or something, Chris, because that line <laughs> looks kind of old. I don't know. Maybe that's how Detroit wants it. They want to look old, but it looks kind of old to me. I'd upgrade that thing. <laughs> so because of the decisions that Campbell made, as a team coming back, I mean, are you, are you just, hey, look, this this is who he is. This is who we're going to be. We're going to go for it on, in these situations. Or does Campbell learn something from this experience? And you just you just can't do that all the time. 
he's got to learn from it. You've got to learn from it. There's, there's just, I mean, coaching is one of the things about coaching is you have to have a feel. You have to have a gut feel. And there's times when you got to, you know, trust your guys and go for it. There's no doubt about that. There's times you're going to be aggressive and go for it. You can't do anything in the NFL all the time. I think a prime example of that is down in San Diego where they had um, the old Rams offense or defensive coordinator running that show down there. And man, he, he, he was like, you know, betting all the time, like he's in Vegas and <laughs> Mike, like Mike March, you know, you get run out of the NFL when you make too many bets. So <laughs> you're, there's, there's times when you gotta, you know, you gotta use good common sense. You've gotta use, you gotta know where your guys are. You gotta have a feel. Um, you can't just, do something all the time. You got to. Um, I looked at that Super Bowl game and Wilkes on that defense kept running the exact same defense against Kansas City, and you just can't do that. Not the whole second half. He was trying to play that zone with the man in inside, and he never changed up the entire second half. He just can't do the same thing over and over and over. You just can't. You got to mix right. it up. You got even when you're playing a Tom Brady or a, or a, against a Mahomes. You got to make them think. Jim, switching gears a little bit. The last time we had you on the football show, you had reached out to me and talked about how you've got some new equipment that you had at the time and you wanted to test out in preparation for what we were hoping for was going to be the Jim Everett podcast. The <laughs> calendar is certainly full being a guest on other podcasts and TV and radio shows. Are we going to get the Jim Everett show at some point? Oh, I don't know about that. We were doing some stuff and Chris uh, I appreciate you asking my my mom passed away last September and so that was uh we've been helping my dad and taking some stuff so we had to we had to do I had to go plan b there for a minute to uh so by the time we got back grounded uh we were just I just said well we'll look at it in 2024 but uh you know, we've got some plans about um some stuff that has to do with you know hopefully we can mix it with crypto stuff that we're doing and and just a whole mix of things that are going on, but uh, we've got some ideas and we'll, I'll keep you posted on how they plan out. Jimmy, this is a golf show. So I, I got to talk golf with you for a few minutes. Let's go. And I, and I have to imagine that over the years, you've been invited to play in several pro amps, particularly during your days playing for the Rams out there in LA. You had a house at one point there at Marabella country club. Talk about your golf game. <laughs> well, I tell you, it's been about, uh, Chris, I love the game of golf. I don't know if you know, I was on the high school golf team. So, I mean, I was, and I was a member of Cota de Casa for years, and about a one and a half handicap. So anyways, I loved it. It wasn't until, you know, I had to start getting new body parts, you know, with these, <laughs> when you play the NFL, the NFL means not for long for your joints. I'm telling you. So <laughs> got five new ones i'm just trying to get them i'm trying to get them calibrated anyways <laughs> but, uh, and they're not callaways and pings i'm not talking about those type of equipment but um but, and they have names for these things but these doctors put in some good hits and stuff like that but chris hopefully i can get out there at some point in time but uh you know uh, i i've had a chance to play back in the day in the bob hope and and play with some really, really uh, chance to play with Tiger Woods. Um, Is that right? Yeah, I mean we're just, it was fabulous time. And I'm telling you, when you play with guys of that caliber, Lanny Watkins, I remember one time. I mean, he just casually shot like 64. I was just like, wow, wow. Yeah. They make it look so easy. Tiger, Tiger, believe it or not, I could say this. He was hungover when he played with us. And he just, <laughs> yeah, he, it was during his during one of his outings i guess but uh he came in and uh still shoots like 68 so it was like nothing for him anyways it was it was good but just to see the best guys on the planet stroke it is just unbelievable you know it's probably like watching the nfl and seeing some of these guys some of the guys throw it like um like allen josh allen for ball uh buffalo man he's got such a such a gun on him um you know, that's it's fun to watch him play and, uh, you know, and hopefully Buffalo will get their act together. It seems like they always are contending, but they just miss out at the very end. Yeah, it rips Angela's heart out. And for those who don't know, Angelo Kane was my original co-host over on the football side on our show Thursday Night Tailgate. Yeah, it gets him going every year. It's like the Lucy and Charlie Brown scene where 
She puts the football down. It's going to be your year. This is going to be a year. I'm not going to pull the football away from you. I'm not going to rip your heart out. And Charlie Brown and the Buffalo Bills fans come running, and they pull the ball away, and it breaks their heart again. It's awful for him. Chris, I mean, we, if Ange was here, this is exactly what I'd say. You know, they've got it slated to build a brand new stadium, right? And I'm thinking, oh, how wonderful is that? They're going to build a new stadium in Buffalo. And then, and then it's going to be open seating. It's no dome. It's no nothing. And then all of a sudden, you've got to pay these guys, you know, to dig out six feet of snow before a playoff. <laughs> I'm like, how about a dome? How, I mean, well, Chris, well, how about a no. dome? No, you no, can't put a dome in Buffalo, Jim. Come on, you got to play in the weather. That's what it's all well, about, we'll, isn't it? We'll stand out, stand outside and drink in the weather, and then come inside, <laughs> and so you can have like a a, a game. But six feet of snow, shoveling for twenty bucks an hour. I don't know about that. I don't know about that. <laughs> You're not down for that? Well, no, I'm not. I'm not thinking. I'm flying to Buffalo in the middle of January to watch a playoff game, but Minnesota, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> Jim, uh, changing gears just a slightly. I, I read that you have quite a football card and memorabilia collection. The article I read said you have all 762 cards produced of you. Is that right? That is true. That is true. 762 of them, though, by the way. I know. They keep making them on an annual basis, too. And, <laughs> and I, just, I just went and signed some, too. But it was uh, it's amazing. I mean, the... um. We didn't have, let's, let's reflect back when we were going through, we didn't have name, image, and likeness going to college like these kids now. We didn't have the transfer <laughs> portal so we could go make 800000 and throw for Ohio State or maybe $3 million to go play for USC. But, you know, a card here and there, that's, that's whatever. But, yeah, 700 and some cards is unbelievable. And I read in that same article that the one that means the most to you is the one that has to do with studying. Talk yep. about that one. Well, it was okay. So my parents were both um, teachers, right? My dad was at the University of New Mexico. They started the special ed department. My mom was a resource room. So education has always been um, a kind of a high bar for us, you know, bring home the A's and do this. Education was always piped. And, when your dad's a professor and your mom's a, a teacher, that's kind of how it goes. Well, upon ending my NFL career, I was the least educated in my family with a bachelor's degree. So I had to go back and get my master's too. So, you know, it was like, I think I just value it. And I, and I value it for my kids. I value it for my grandkids. And I think that, you know, if you have a chance to, to, you know, get a degree or get a certification or whatever it might be to be a, a little bit more special in your field, I'd say go for it and don't be afraid of it. Jim, you mentioned the word crypto a little bit ago. Talk about what you're doing now with Game Changer Management. Oh, thank you, Chris. We're we're just getting a consultant co a company off and we're involved in a, a wide range of different projects, uh, more on the looking at the NFTs and how we can, how we get, you know, the Web3 stuff that's coming out. So it's it's really interesting space interesting time and i look at crypto as a way um uh it's not really money i wouldn't look at it as that but an exchange of value and i think once you see that you can have an instant change of value things happen and i think i think that's where our future i mean let's t look at on january i think it's january 11th the sec approved bitcoin for people to be able to hold and that was i was in the financial business for 15 years and I've been, I've been, you know, messing around with crypto since 2014. So, wow. you know, it, yeah. So now that it took to 2024 for the SEC to be able to say, okay, it's legal to, you know, basically hold it. So um, anyways, I think there's a lot of value to it. It's a ledger and a payment system all in one. And I think that as we get forward, I think Visa and all these people will embrace it. Jim, before I let you go, remind our listeners, how can they stay up to date with what you're doing with Game Changer Management and with you, whether it's online or it's on social media? Oh, Chris, I appreciate it. Most of the stuff you can get at me on Twitter at Jim, uh, Jim underscore Everett um, and get some of the latest and greatest, either either um, me uh, 
you know, you take take some of the stuff I post with a, gr- a grain of salt. You know, I try to stay away from politics, but I don't shy away from comedy. <laughs> no, you do not. Oh, maybe those are both the same. <laughs> That's fantastic. <laughs> Jim, you're the best, my friend. I can't thank you enough for taking time out of your evening to come back and be a part of the show. I appreciate you so very much. Words can't describe how much I think of you and and uh, appreciate all you've done for for me and Bob over on the football side as well. Oh, you bet, Chris. You've always you know, I'm always a fan of yours, and and I hope the Pittsburgh Steelers the best. I mean, I really do. I mean, I I, I go into the story where I was almost a Pittsburgh Steeler. Um, I was almost traded there, um, but they didn't. Uh, my agent didn't tell me. But is uh, that right? Yeah, it's a long story. But in 1991, the tower was trying to trade for me and i didn't find out about it till probably 98 after i retired is that right yeah kevin green was already over there duval love was already over there a bunch of us uh, rams it was almost jerome bettis Bettis went over there and tower was trying to get me but for some reason my agent just didn't tell me ah yeah and the year they went and, and neil threw three picks in the yeah yeah don't yeah, yeah. With that you're not allowed to say that name on this show oh hey <laughs> hey but terry bradshaw is a good friend of mine and always was one of my heroes growing up so i always have a soft spot for the Steelers. well we appreciate you jim you betcha take care my friend all the best you and your family i hope we get to catch up with you again soon okay chris talk, see, talk soon see you buddy see you, jim that is the great jim everett folks almost a Steeler, and his agent didn't tell him now, now i'm hurt what would have been like to had Jim Everett in that Super Bowl instead of what's his name? Oh, now that's that's going to take a little time to to register and for process. Anyway, Jimmy's a great friend and he has been so good to us over the years and a wonderful you know, wonderful person first of all. And then his insights around the game of football, I, I promise you, are second to none. And the guy is a fiend at fantasy football. He just knows stuff and knows players and knows tendencies and that sort of thing. He belongs on a network show uh, or call and plays as, as someone's OC somewhere. I can't believe that that hasn't happened or a quarterback coach or something along those lines. But anyway, a wonderful guy, and I'll have him back on the show again soon. Coming up next is going to be the 2014 Georgia PGA Teacher of the Year and a longtime friend of this show, Kevin Roman. Before I get to Kevin, I was talking with Eddie Dry, VP of Domestic Sales for Strixon Cleveland Golf, at the PGA Merchandise Show earlier this year, and I said, Eddie, I like your CBX full-face wedges. How can they help an average player like me play better? Here's what he had to say. An average player, I use one, and I'm in some lies that you can't even believe. And I need all the help I can get. And the face is bigger, and the grooves go all the way up and all the way out to the toe. So if you hit it on the toe, you miss it, bam, there's a groove. So I like that. So I carry a 58. There you have it, folks. Try the new CBX full face wedges from Cleveland Golf. Okay, now back and next on the tee with me is 2014 Georgia PGA Teacher of the Year, Kevin Roman. Let me remind you about Kevin's background. He was a golf pro at Cherokee Town and Country Club in Atlanta for several years. And Cherokee is the most prestigious club in the city of Atlanta. Membership by invitation only, my friends. He recently spent a few years as the director of instruction out at Monterey Peninsula Country Club in California, right there next to Pebble Beach. Besides being one of the top instructors in the country, Kevin is a fantastic player. He's played in a couple of majors, including the 1993 U.S. Open at Baltus Roll and the 2009 PGA Championship at Hazeltine. He is now the director of instruction at Sea Pines Country Club in Sea Pines, South Carolina, and I couldn't be more honored I get to have him back with me again this week here on Next on the Tee. Hey, Kevin, how are you, my friend? Hey, Chris, uh, thanks for having me back on. Kevin, I haven't had the privilege of having you back on the show since you made your way back down here to the southeast to see Pines. How are things going? All is great. Um, you know, I've been very blessed to end up here. Uh, great club, beautiful facilities to teach out of, and uh, membership's been great so far. So, Kevin, I got to get your thoughts. As you saw last weekend, Hideki Matsuyama goes out and wins the Genesis Invitational with a fourth round charge. He shot 63 and ends up winning by th- or 62 and ends up winning by three. He's a Strixon guy, as are you. And Strixon is one of the sponsors of this show. 
It was a great win for Hideki and for the brand. Talk about what you saw from him. You know, Hideki, when he gets hot, it's amazing. He's one of the, the best iron players, ball strikers uh, in the game. And I know you saw those couple iron shots at the end that he hit, you know, two to three feet repeatedly. And uh, he just kind of kept the pedal to the metal, and he's really good at that. He plays the Strixon Z Forge two irons. Talk about the irons that he's playing, and uh, talk about you know forged irons and what they can do for our game. Yeah, um, he plays the blade version. The uh, Strixon makes multiple different uh, types of Strixon uh, irons, and he's playing the forged blade. And uh, a lot of them play the ZX seven, which is the cavity back forge blade. Um, the forge blade though really gives them a lot of feedback. And allows you one to shape shots if you wanted to. And I honestly believe when you get into the uh, blade category, you learn to hit the ball a lot more in the center of the face because you get the feedback uh, when it's hit off center, whereas the cavity back sometimes mutes that feel. Um, so it really helps ball strikers uh, improve their game if they're using a more of a traditional forged blade club. Kevin, one of the things our listeners have asked me about, and I invite everyone to send any questions you might have to me at Chris at next on the T.net or on social media at CT Mascaro. But Kevin, I've received several questions about ditching our long irons in favor of a, a fairway wood, like a five, seven or nine wood. At what point do you think we should seriously consider putting it, putting down our four or five and maybe even six iron for whether it's a hybrid or one of those uh, fairway woods like a five, seven, or nine? Um, let's, we'll put it one word yesterday. How's that sound for a <laughs> timeline? <laughs> Talk about why. Um, really, what it comes down to a lot is club head speed. And you're also seeing a lot of uh, regular tour players going to seven woods. And, you know, it's so the ball goes so far now for, for the tour guys, and the three woods just, go too far so they've had to use more loft to able to have the ball land softly on the greens and there isn't a average amateur player that i've seen that wouldn't want their longer shots into the green to land softer so they can stay on the greens um not only do they land softer by being able to get the ball up in the air they actually carry a lot farther so it's a win-win for the average person um usually when i get into people and they don't have the highest of club head speeds. Uh, I find when you get them into five woods, they go as far, if not farther, than their three woods. So it's just really an easy uh, branch to get them into something that is more playable for them, uh, gets them to be able to hold the greens in the five, sevens, and nines. And, you know, even with the long irons and the hybrids, it's just becoming such an easier game to get the ball up in the air. And I think people need to embrace that technology and, and to really enjoy the game a lot more. Kevin, speaking of technology, the other thing we've started to talk more about recently here on the show is getting fit, not just for your golf clubs, but for your golf ball. All too often, we see tour players out there playing a certain golf ball, and we want to go out and buy that ball, figuring, well, if it's the best one for them, it must be the best one for me, too. But they swing much differently than we do. They certainly swing much faster than most of us do. Talk about how to find which golf ball is actually the best one for our game? Yeah, a lot of the tour guys will, will kind of, when they do their fittings, they'll work from the green back, meaning they're trying to find a ball that allows them to have some spin and, and, and control around the greens and then back off to the longer clubs. Uh, the average person, uh, they hit a lot of wedge shots and they need to be able to get their wedges closer on the green. So I always tell them to start sometimes with a little bit spinnier ball um, to help them maybe stop it around the green. And if they really don't like that feel or they don't really feel like they have as much control, to break down into a little, say, softer core ball to help them to get the ball launched up into the air more, and that'll also let them hold the greens. Because you can stop the ball either A, with spin, or B, with height. And when you're doing some testing, like I'll go out with a different tricks on models on a launch monitor, and I will hit lots of balls and see what kind of how high do they fly what's the landing angle you know how far do they go just taking all those little data points into it really helps you zero in on which ball uh, maximize what you're trying to do whether it be distance whether it be height 
whether it be spin. Um, that's the, the beauty of the game is without having one ball that everybody has to play, we can pick balls that actually match or optimize our games. Speaking of short game and optimizing our games, let's talk a little bit about those things and, and the right clubs for us because we've seen some wedges like the new Cleveland CBX Full Face 2. They've got grooves all the way across the entire face of the club. They're on uh, Golf Digest hot list for 2024. But does that make a difference? Does it really help our game a lot if we ha find a wedge that now has a full face groove? Yeah, yeah that's, a, that's a great question. And I would say yes for two reasons. One, we played in a, a tournament or when I give a lot of lessons, I'll see uh, some of my playing partners or, or lesson people. And you see a lot of wear marks out toward the toe on the average person because they come in a little bit steeper, slightly maybe in the out. Maybe the handle's raising up a little bit. So they get a lot of balls off the toe. And a lot of times when I see that mark out there, not only are they on the edge of the grooves, you're going to see some wear marks outside of the grooves. So having that extra long groove out there allows them to, one, maintain spin if they do happen to catch it, where traditionally there is no groove. Um, you don't want to lose that spin. You don't want it to come off uh, with with no spin that when it hits the green, that it really takes off. So I think for the average person, having grooves on the edge of the club allows them, one, to get away with a lot more mistakes. Now I can also say I play the full, full face grooves in my lob wedge, and I like to play a lot of shots more towards the toe of my club, uh, especially when you get in some of the Bermuda grasses and the grainy grasses. I'll stand the club up a little more vertical and the heel of the club is in the air. And then from there, you just let the toe hit. The toe does two things. One, if the toe hits, it opens the face a little, which creates a little more bounce and it doesn't allow you to chunk any chip shot. And by having the grooves out there when I stand it up, I still maintain all my spin rates and the ability to really have the ball checked around the green. So whether it's from a swing that's a little bit deep and catching the toe or whether it's by design of setting the club up there to allow the club to go through the grass better, uh, having grooves out there does give you a lot more options to uh, help you control the ball around the greens. Okay, so that sparks a question for me because for those of us that struggle as we get closer to the greens with our chipping because we may chunk a shot, talk about setup. Is it better for us to stand closer and to have the handle a little more vertical and get that heel up off the ground so when we're chipping, it eliminates the opportunity to chunk it? Oh, definitely. Um, I'll use what I call just a more of a baseline type setup for average people. And it's really been uh, much easier for the people to play. And I'll, and I'll do, I'll, I'll explain a couple of ways if you don't mind that I do the setup. Sure. Um, the first thing I have people do is basically um, put their feet about one club head width apart, which for most people is a lot closer than they're used to. Um, I think a lot of people around the greens get very wide with their feet. And that allows them to move side to side. And then they have a tough time controlling where the club bottoms out on the ground. So I get them about one club head to part. I also set them up very square. I see most of my lessons, especially people who are struggling, will tend to open their feet up and think they got to aim left. And they play the ball back, which allows the leading edge to dig. And then there's that chunk shot again. So I'll get them to feel that their feet, like I said, one club head apart. Uh, nice square setup. They stand very close to the ball, and I actually let their their wrists, and I always have them hold the club out in front of them, and imagine they're pointing their thumbs down to the ground as much as you can. So when their wrists the wrist kind of arch downward, it kind of locks them in fully extended, and then from there, they can stand next to the golf ball and just basically turn their chest back and turn their chest through, and it just gives you a very huge margin of error. Kevin, you've been a teacher all over the country, like I mentioned in your intro. You've been here in Georgia, been out in California, been up to New York, now down to South Carolina. Turf conditions are very different going from region to region. And certainly as you get out towards the coast, you get a little more water. How does the impact of the of the right wedge bounce change depending on where we live? Yeah, that's. I think that's imperative for people to kind of understand what their bounces do. Um, I traditionally try to get two different bounces. On my sand wedge, I use a higher bounce club. 
and on my lo most lofted wedge, I'll use a little bit lower bounce club. So if I need to hit it off of a down slope and get it up in the air, having that little bit less bounce allows me to slide down the down slope a little bit. But uh, traditionally, I will use my higher bounce club for most shots around the green. And I think once you get into the Bermudas, uh, you really want to make sure you have more bounce, a higher leading edge off the ground, so you can minimize the amount uh, that the leading edge digs into that grain in the Bermuda, because that makes it very difficult to pitch. Uh, whereas if you're on the northern grasses or the bent grasses, you don't get that grain, so you can get away with a little bit different, if you want to call it a lower bounce, even though I still play you know, a pretty full bounce. I play a full sole wedge, which I like a lot of bounce, which is 12 degrees in the Cleveland. Uh, I've also dabbled with the mid grind, which has the leading edge, the bounce a little bit closer to the leading edge. When I get on a Bermuda, if you're or if you're a little bit of a square face chipper, you don't like to open the face much, having that bounce towards the leading edge just gives you that little bit extra forgiveness that you're not going to get that front edge stuck into the turf. So there's a couple different ways to look at it. And the best way to do it is to find a, a club that, you know, hopefully it's a Cleveland wedge or whatever, but whatever you do, go out and try some different ones and see, can you make the club slide through the turf cleanly or does it kind of get stuck a little? If it gets stuck, add a little bounce or try a different uh, bounce a little bit more forward in the wedge. And I think people will be surprised how much easier having the right club really makes it around the greens. Kevin, one of the best drivers I've hit over recent years is the Strixon ZX5, another 2024 gold winner. I liked it right away, but our good friend Eddie Dry said, if you like that, I've got another shaft I want you to try. And he, he put that shaft in it, and suddenly I'm pounding it straighter with some extra yardage that I thought I lost. But talk about the new drivers and why it's important for us to go to the PGA Tour Superstore, try it out, and actually get fit with the right shaft in it, not just buy what we get right off the rack. Yeah. Uh, each person, I did a, actually a shaft fitting at the PGA show with, uh, nip on and they were great and i talked to the guy for like an hour even afterward just to, to do some stuff and when it comes to shafts we each have a lack of better words a load profile where some people are very quick in transition from the top of their swing down some people are smoother a la Payne stewart so they could get away with a slightly softer feeling shaft that doesn't have to be as firm where if someone's very quick with the transition they're going to need a firmer shaft overall just to control the club um a lot of people think well i don't have a high club head speed so i need to use a soft shaft or vice versa i have a very high speed but i need a firm shaft and it's not always that way it really comes down to how quickly you make the transition how much the load or pressure you put on the shaft so really getting fit allows you to match that profile to the shaft that's in your club to help you optimize your launch condition, spin condition. Kevin, just a couple more before I let you go. And, and like I say, you're one of the most sought after instructors in the country. Talk about what you've got coming up here in 2024. Yeah. You know, it's, it's been a great year coming here to see pines uh, start the last fall. Uh, I'm also doing a lot with transcend golf on Instagram where they're helping a lot of people. Uh, they just signed uh, the two AJGA players of the year. Uh, Caleb Surratt was one. He just joined Liv uh, as a 19-year-old. He's had a great 12th place finish, 13th place finish. And they're always looking to help the young kids grow and, and, and help them get away with it and be able to do the things in the game they want to do. So I've been doing some videos for them online. They also meet with all the players, and, and they're doing their own little Instagram posts for them on there. So it's a great way to follow the young up-and-coming amateurs. Um, and hopefully I get some tips in there that might help them win their game also. So that's been a great uh, addition for me to do, and I really enjoy it. Um, looking to ramp up my game again this year. I uh, just signed up for the Senior U.S. Open Qualifier, so we'll see if we can get through that this year. But if I don't sign up for tournaments, I don't, I don't play a lot. So this is my motivation to get me out there playing. That's awesome. Kevin, for folks that want to see those videos, that you're doing or follow you online or on social media. How can they do it? Yeah. Mine is Kevin Roman golf on Instagram and the other uh, media that I post on is uh, transcend golf. 
Well, Kevin, I can't thank you enough for taking time to come and back and uh, be a part of the show this week. You're fantastic. You're always one of my favorites and uh, your knowledge is second to none, my friend. I can't thank you enough for sharing it. I hope we get this privilege again of uh, having you on the show soon. No, you're the best, Chris. I really appreciate everything you do for the game of golf. And like I said, best uh, golf show going. Well, I appreciate that very much, my friend. Take care, Kevin. All the best to you and your family. I look forward to catching up with you again soon. You too, Chris. Have a great day. See you, Kevin. That is the great Kevin Roman, folks. Kevin Roman Golf over on Instagram. And Transcend Golf is where those videos can be found. And Kevin has been a wonderful friend for many years coming on the show and and sharing his thoughts. Tonight was the seventh time I've had that privilege. Um, A guy that has been a director of instruction at just about every great place. You want to talk about being here in Atlanta at one of the top courses, you know, here in the city, but then going out to uh, Monterey Peninsula Country Club right out there next to Pebble Beach, going up to New York for a little while and doing some things over there. And now at Sea Pines, the guy just knows his stuff and his instruction is top notch and he's just a wonderful human being on top of all of that. So I can't thank Kevin enough. Be sure to give him a follow again, Kevin Roman Golf, and check out Transcend Golf. We'll get Kevin back on the show again soon. Joining me next is going to be a guy whose passion for giving back is second to none and another wonderful friend of the show for many, many years, and that is Russ Holden. Before I get to Russ, coming up next is a lady who has been named one of the 50 best golf fitness professionals by Golf Digest in our game, and that is Catherine Roberts. Catherine is an amazing lady. She's going to do a lot for us to help us use ground forces and our bodies to really get more strength and power in our game. Before I get to Catherine, I want to remind you about our friends over at Two Under. Two Under Men's Performance Briefs are the unofficial underwear of the PGA, Ryder Cup, and President's Cup teams and are sold in over 3,000 golf pro shops and golf specialty retailers nationwide. Ricky Fowler is their global ambassador and over 50 other PGA, Corn Ferry, and Champions Tour players wear them. Just to mention a few, they are David Toms, Jerry Kelly, Justin Thomas, William McGirt, Jason Kokrak, Scott McCarron, and Chris DeMarco. The Joey Pouch technology provides the ultimate male asset management, delivering maximum comfort from the tee box to the boardroom to the bedroom. Use code NEXTONT20 to save 20% off your order at 2under.com. That's the number two, U-N-D-R dot com. Two under, performance in your pants. Okay, now joining me for the ninth time here on Next on the T is former tour caddy Russ Holden. You've heard me talking for years about the wonderful work that Russ has done with his organization, Caddy for a Cure, which helps provide not only opportunities for wounded veterans to be the caddy for a day for some of the top players on the PGA Tour, but also gifts life-changing things to some of those veterans as well. Russ is also a Class A PGA professional, and he was the head golf pro at Woodfield Country Club in Boca Raton, Florida. That's where he met Bernhard Langer and caddied for him from 1991 to 2006. Russ also served as the caddy captain for the 2004 European Ryder Cup team. Going back to his college days, he played golf at Malone University and was an NAIA All-American in 1980. He was also named All-Mid-Ohio Conference in both 1980 and 81 and the Mid-Ohio Conference MVP in that 81 season as well. He was inducted into the Malone University Hall of Fame in 1994. He's now taken the work he's done for Caddy for a Cure and transitioned it to a new organization called Inspiring Warriors Golf. He has been a wonderful friend for many years, and I couldn't be more thrilled I get to have him back with me again this week here on Next on the Tee. Hey, Russ, how are you, my friend? Uh, Chris, uh, thank you so much for having me uh, once again. Uh, always great to be with you, my favorite podcast and show uh, in all of golf. And uh, I love all your guests that you have, always compelling, and uh, just delighted to be with you tonight. Well, I can't thank you enough for that, Russ. I appreciate you very much, my friend. Russ, a lot to get into today, but before we do, give us an update on your daughter, Kayla, how she's doing. She's a heck of a player at the University of Tennessee. Every year I've been following her, and her scoring average has gotten better and better each year. I saw she shot a second round 67 to finish fifth at the Tar Heel Invitational. Talk about her game. She's uh, having a great year. She's in her senior year, believe it or not. Uh, We're just... uh stunned with that but uh, we just got back last night from sarasota she played in the uh 
Michigan State Spartan Invitational and had uh, two pretty good days. Uh, shot one under and finished tied seven and uh, had another top 10 uh, finish for her and her team finished third. Uh, they finished second two weeks ago in Guadalajara, uh, Mexico, and she had a, I think a top 20. I think she finished 18th, tied 18th or something like that. So she's been playing some good golf and has big aspirations uh, to go somewhere down the road after school. And we're just going to see what, uh, what happens. Your son, Brandon's a heck of a player as well. Give us an update on how Brandon's doing. Brandon, uh, we're very happy. Uh, Brandon got his first head professionals job uh, following in, in my footsteps, I guess you could say, uh, down here in West Palm Beach in South Florida, where we live. Uh, he's at the Mayaku Lakes Country Club and a uh, big job for him, a great job. And he's got a great membership over there. It's a wonderful club with a great history. And uh, he took over there in October and uh, had just had a a baby boy here about uh, five, six weeks ago. So uh, oh, it's congrats, pretty, nice to have, pretty nice to have two grandchildren now, just uh, less than an hour away from us. And uh, hopefully we get to spend a lot of time with them as the season winds down here. And he uh, stops spending a hundred hours a week over there at the club, which he needs to do this time of the year. Russ, you've done so many great things for our wounded veterans through the years, through your Caddy for a Cure program. Now you're doing something slightly different uh, with Inspiring Warriors Golf. Talk about what that new program is all about. Well, thanks, Chris. You know, uh, we, we did have a military component uh, for many, many years. You remember in 2005, I was working for Bernhard uh, down in San Antonio uh, at the La, Con at La Cantera at the Texas Open. And the military, the PGA Tour is incredibly military patriotic. And they walked six young men uh, down the range who had just been treated at Brook Medical Center. Uh, where a lot of our veterans go as they're injured. They either go to Brooke or they go, many of them go to Walter Reed. Obviously, everyone knows Walter Reed. But uh, the, these young men had all lost legs, and it was a chilling sight for me. And, uh, you know, I had this great idea. Well, Chris can come out and caddy for Bernhard Langer. Why couldn't he or she be escorted by a wounded service member? Uh, it took the PJ Tour about three and a half megaseconds to say, yeah, we love that idea. And uh, we proceeded to start offering those opportunities and did it uh, quite successfully for about 16 years, I think it was, until uh, the pandemic hit. Uh, once the pandemic hit, it obviously changed everybody's world. And we were on the outside looking in, uh, waiting for things to clear. And we got to do a lot of insightful thinking as to how we could continue to keep serving. And as you mentioned, I'm a, I'm a PJ Life member, and I miss teaching, and I wanted to get back to it. So I had an idea that we could do a week-long mission where we would bring in a dozen uh, catastrophically wounded veterans and treat them to a world uh, of which they're not familiar into the world of golf. Uh, obviously, some great instruction, which is nothing revolutionary. There's many professionals around the country that do that and around the world, and it's awesome that we do that. But beyond that, we wanted to do some life coaching. Uh, we didn't want to really get inside uh, and, and pull the demons out. Uh, we, we really wanted to focus on this great game of golf that we all love so much. Uh, we, we know that golf takes you to places that you may never have gone before. It allows you to meet people uh, that you would have never met before. It allows you to learn things about yourself that uh, you might not have ever learned outside of playing golf. And, and for us, most importantly, the thing that, that we learned was the identity crisis that women, women, men and women injured have. They, they serve this great country for 5, 10, 15, 20 years, and they get hurt. And they lose their identity. They go home to great families and, and wives and children and spouses, and uh, they're a fish out of water. And they they miss their battle buddies. And golf provides that immensely incredible opportunity to be out there for five or six hours with your battle buddy. Uh, and, and it's relatable. It's identifiable. And uh, we know that we've had an incredible impact as a result of the missions that we do. We focus on overcoming adversity. We bring in guest speakers at every eating opportunity we have, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, that uh, it, it's motivation, it's uh, overcoming adversity, it's people on the on the biggest end, on the inside world of golf. Uh, and then most importantly, we partner with another operation called the Warrior's Journey up out of Springfield, Missouri. Kevin Weaver and his team up there uh, specialize in suicide prevention. Um, and it's really Warriors uh, relating to other warriors and healing those invisible wounds that these men and women have, whether they're physically injured or not, they still all have invisible wounds. And we do the golf part. I like to uh, say I'm pretty one-dimensional. 
I do the golf side and uh, we like to think we do a pretty good job there, but then we hand them off to the warrior's journey. So not only do they get this insight in the world of golf, but then they're held on to going forward in their journey uh, from the warrior's journey, helping with, with everything, whether it's VA benefits, whether it's disability, whether it's a hot water heater, whether it's problems in their marriage, uh, whether it's that moment that they feel that they might not want to go on, Warrior's Journey is there for them. So by partnering with this large organization, much larger than us, uh, we're able to really provide the Warriors with a, a, a full circle encompassment, uh, not only of their golf life, but also their personal life going forward. Russ, you mentioned a moment ago, insightful thinking. You did some great work with the U.S. Chaplain Corps at the Pentagon to identify the most common challenges that our veterans face. What did you learn? Well, again, we learned that they have these invisible wounds. Um, and, and, and again, it's that identifying uh, identity. Uh, you know, the, the, as I said, the, these men and women wore that uniform uh, for so long. And they, they, that, that's their identity. And all of a sudden, it's taken from them. And they, they don't have it anymore. And uh, we need to provide opportunities. And, and we have what the best thing we have to offer is the game of golf. Uh, you know, it's been my life. I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't have gotten to do anything that I've gotten to do in my life. And I've been so fortunate to be able to do some really awesome things and meet some incredible people. Uh, and, and we're able to pass that along, uh, you know, through, through my career and as well as the many other golf professionals that we have helping us, you know, the, the likes of. Bob Ford, uh, famous uh, uh, golf professional, really, you know, to my mind, the, the, the Jack Nicholas of golf professionals at Oakmont and Seminole, and Bob Dolan recently just uh, in, in inducted into the PGA Hall of Fame. Steve Parker from Northern Ohio, uh, Chris or, or Mark and uh, Leslie Guttenberg, uh, Rob Shaw from New Jersey, another Hall of Famer up in New Jersey. All these men and women, you know, when they heard about what we were doing with Inspiring Warriors Golf, they couldn't raise their hand fast enough to be able to say, I'm in, we want to help, whatever you need, we're here. And uh, it, that's been incredibly impactful on our Warriors. Russ, you mentioned some of the great speakers that you've had come there, and a couple of mutual friends of ours, like Gary Player and Dennis Walters, have come to speak at your events. What are some of the inspirational messages that people have shared? Well, you don't really need to go very far with Dennis Walters. Uh, you know, Dennis is uh, literally one of my best friends, if not my best friend. I spend a day or two a week with him. And uh, Dennis is overcoming some adversity right now. Uh, he's been working now almost a year with a company called Rewalk and an exoskeleton. Uh, Dennis is 74 years old, been paralyzed for 48 years. Uh, in the World Golf Hall of Fame, has performed over 3,500 shows around the world just an incredibly inspiring man. And here he is at 74 years old. He took 818 steps the other day outdoors, which is just nothing short of a miracle in this exoskeleton. But uh, when, when he performs for our warriors, he's able to relate. You know, when, when, when our guys are sitting there and they're hurt uh, catastrophically in many places, losing limbs, losing arms, legs, um, and obviously, again, to repeat those invisible wounds that they have, when they look at Dennis, uh, and, you know, and his tagline is, if your dream doesn't work out, that's okay. Get a new dream. And he passes that message along to these warriors. Hey, you know what? If your dream doesn't work out, and obviously all their dreams didn't work out, uh, get a new dream. And that message is loud and clear. Uh, Gary Player, uh, you, can't, uh, you can't really beat anybody more inspiring or motivational than listening to Gary Player speak. And he has a real heart for our military. He has a love for this country as though he was born and raised here. He loves America. He loves our military. He appreciates it. He's had family that serve uh, in the military, and, and it's really near and dear to his heart. And uh, he's always been first in line to raise his hand whenever we ask uh, to help out with whatever we need with the Warriors. And, you know, we had a guest speaker here at our last mission in December, uh, John Foley, call sign Gucci, uh, Blue Angels pilot, 92-93, uh, blue with the famous Blue Angels and those Super Hornets and, and Hornets back then. Uh, incredible man. Uh, and he came and spoke uh, really about using the tagline that the Blue Angels all say, and that is glad to be here. Uh, they have a glad to be here mentality uh, in the ready room and when they're flying. Those six pilots up in the air uh, have a, a, a debrief method 
that is unlike anything else. And that's why they are the most successful team of anything uh, in the world. The United States Navy Blue Angels. And Gucci came and uh, spent a couple of days with our Warriors and closed as our keynote speaker and just absolutely crushed it uh, and, and gave a message to these guys that, hey, we are glad to be here. And when you adopt that attitude of gratitude, uh, it goes a long ways. And uh, it's been very impactful and, and will continue to be impactful for our Warriors. You know a thing or two about being a Blue Angel, don't you? <laughs> yeah, I uh, I was honored to be able to work with the Blue Angels Foundation for uh, almost 10 years and uh, help them out uh, in a great way. I served as their executive director for a little while and I uh, got to uh, got to get my behind in the back seat of a Super Hornet here a couple of years ago. And uh, I'm only allowed to talk about it for a short period of time for my wife, because if you get me going on it, I'll talk to you for hours about what it's like <laughs> to go uh, and pull seven and a half G's. It was uh, really one of the best hours of my life. And uh, they're not very, very rarely a day goes by that I don't sometime during the day think about flying with the Blue Angels. It was a once in a lifetime experience. Russ, I saw a post and some pictures of you with former President Trump a couple of days ago. Looks like you were out there with some veterans playing golf with him. What was that experience like? Yeah, you know, President Trump, uh, when we started this, uh, when we started Inspiring Warriors Golf three three years ago, uh, had some connections up at his place up in uh, West Palm Beach and uh, asked them if they'd be willing to host, uh, you know, our, our, our 12 veterans. And uh, again, the answer, yes, came back loud and clear. And uh, the president actually came out and spent an hour with our wounded. And uh, it was a magical hour for, for everyone that was there. He's continued to invite us back every year. In fact, one year he came back and he actually said, hey, the place is yours. Guys, go wherever you want. Do whatever you want. Hit balls off the greens for all I care. Um, the place is yours and, and we're honored to, to have you here. So on, uh, on Friday, uh, we had the opportunity to go, uh, go up there with uh, the Warriors Journey, Kevin Weaver. And uh, there's a young man who was just mentioned by uh, Kevin named Caleb Surratt. And uh, Caleb is actually dating one Kayla Holden, and uh, they're uh, they're in a very nice relationship and uh, have been together for for some time now. And uh, uh, Caleb uh, was able to play with the president on Friday and had a great day, had a great round of golf up at uh, Palm Beach and at Trump International. And uh, we were honored to be able to be there and, and see it all through and make sure that it happened. And it, and it went terrific. Uh, Caleb tore it up, shot 65. And uh, I'm pretty sure that he's going to get invited back to be the president's partner again and maybe take some more money along the way as well. <laughs> so, Russ, as you look out further into 2024, what are some other great events that you guys have planned? So we are next on next on tap is Augusta National. Uh, we have been invited as a guest of the club uh, to come up there the first part of the week. And uh, we're going to do Inspiring Warriors Golf uh, up there in the Augusta area on uh, Sunday, Monday and Tuesday. Uh, and then we have some other plans. Uh, we're talking to some people uh, up in D.C. Uh, Bob Dolan is the professional emeritus at the Columbia Country Club. Uh, we have some connections in Congress. Uh, so Congressional uh, might be on there. And as I mentioned, the president uh, is all behind. Uh, president Trump is all behind uh, what we're doing. And he has a place up in D.C. as well. So we're probably going to do another mission up in D.C. Uh, we're looking at Big Cedar. Uh, over in Branson, Missouri. Uh, we're talking to the Bass Pro Shop people over there right now. Uh, and then we have one more planned at, at our host club here at PGA Golf Club in Port St. Lucie, uh, as well as combining that with Trump International down in South Florida. So hoping to do four, maybe five missions this year and uh, hopefully continue to scale this and ramp it up and be able to do more and more every year. Well, Russ, for our wounded veterans out there, people who know a wounded vet who could really benefit from getting involved and being a part of Inspiring Warriors Golf. How can they get in touch with you or the organization? Yeah, it's great. Uh, you know, we uh, we obviously have limited spaces, but we would love to uh, entertain. If there's anyone listening that has somebody that's special that the, we know is suffering with uh, invisible wounds or anything like that that loves the game of golf, and uh, maybe you think that the golf could be a, a bigger part of their life and maybe help them, we'd be, we'd be honored to uh, to talk to them and see if we can work them into the program. We have a website and we shortened it uh, for, for ease of use, uh, but it's www.iwg.golf. Uh, 
the full URL is inspiringwarriorsgolf.org, but uh, you can get there a little bit faster by just typing in iwg.golf. And you can go there and see uh, videos and pictures of our previous missions and uh, see all the people that have been involved, uh, read a little bio about each mission and, and see some of the warriors that we've had. And you're going to see a lot of smiles. Uh, you're going to see a lot of uh, really, really, really good stuff that uh, when, when you get them there, uh, you get them in our environment of golf. Uh, first day they get there, they're a little apprehensive. What's what's going on here? You know, who are these people? What are they trying to do? Uh, second day, a few laughs. Uh, we're starting to see some some buddies forming, uh, some friendships, some bonding. By the third day, uh, it, it's it's just magical. Uh, in the last day, uh, there's tears uh, because we're ending, uh, and 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 that doesn't end on that day. We have a chat room set up. Uh, we use WhatsApp. We've got everybody on there. We've got about 25 people, all the professionals, Dennis, Dan Beaver, great friend, uh, Gucci's in on this, uh, all our guys. And, and we stay in touch with them. Uh, and and even, even tonight before I came on, I'm getting uh, texts from that chat room. So we've got their battle buddies. They're all in there. And then we still have that fond memory of Inspiring Warriors Golf. But uh, go to iwg.golf. Please use the contact information there and reach out to me personally and i'll be more than happy to follow up and uh let's see what we can do for for any veterans that are out there uh listening or 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 friends of someone that's listening russ how can they check you guys out on social media as well yeah we're still at the caddy for a cure uh we're not going to get rid of our great history that we've had we're going to continue to offer some caddy experiences uh, here and there along the way but uh you go to caddyforacure.com and we spell it with a y c-a-d-d-y uh, F O R A C U R E dot com, but all our all our uh, social media is all just at Caddy for a Cure. Uh, we try to post some pretty compelling uh, stuff about Inspiring Warriors Golf and some of the caddy experiences we've had over the years, and uh, it's uh, it's a lot of fun. We, if Chris, you know, we I don't know how many years it's been that we've been doing this, but uh, you know, twenty three years ago, twenty four years ago, when we sat out to start Caddy for a Cure. I would have never in a million years ever dreamed that I'd be sitting here talking to Chris Mascaro uh, on, on your great show about uh, the history that we've had. We just had a passion for helping, and uh, we knew we wanted to do something and try to make a difference. And in retrospect, looking back, we're, we're very humbled to be able to say that we, we believe we have had an impact on a lot of people, and, and it's been a good thing for, for many, many years. Yes, it has. Russ, you're awesome, my friend. I can't thank you enough for taking time out of your night to come back and be a part of the show. I always love getting to spend time with you because, A, you're just a wonderful human being, and B, you're doing so much good for so many people, particularly our wounded veterans, which is outstanding. Thank you for all you continue to do for our veterans. It's fantastic work. Thank you very much, Chris. That means the world to me. And, uh, it's always an honor to be here with you, and I'll be on your show anytime you'll have me, and hopefully it'll be a, a look forward to the next time that is. Yeah, I'm already looking forward to next time. So hopefully we can get together after some of the other experiences have happened this year. We can hear the stories about how wonderful those are and obviously get an update on uh, on your kids and then the great things there. And again, congrats on uh, being a, a new grandpa for the second time. It's all fantastic. <laughs> That's awesome. If you get down here in Southeast Florida, uh, look us up. I would be offended if I find out you're in Southeast Florida and don't call me to come out here to our great PGA Golf Club in Port St. Lucie. It'd be my treat to be able to uh, play around the golf with you. Boy, wouldn't that be cool? So yes, come on would. down. I nice warm do weather down here. So come no. on down. <laughs> all right. Take care, Russ. All the best all right. you and your family. We'll catch up soon. Thanks, friend. Appreciate it. See you, Russ. That's a great Russ Holden, folks, and IWG.golf. If you're a, a, a military veteran or you know one that could benefit from all the wonderful things that the game of golf brings to your life, plus getting back with warrior buddies and enjoying the game together, please reach out. Go to IWG.golf. I love the fact that he talked about how it transitions into smiles. First day, a little trepidation. But by the time you get into day two and day three, you got a lot of smiles and then tears that the, the four days are over, but they continue to stay together, which I love as well. And uh, kudos to Russ, a passion for helping. That's who Russ Holden is. You break everything else down, strip away the game of golf, strip away the fact that he was a tour caddy for many, many years with Bernhard Langer, a passion for helping. 
those three words describe who the man Russ Holden is. Can't thank him enough. We'll get him back on the show and hear more about it very soon. Coming up next is going to be one of the great ladies in our game, and that is Tammy Mayfair. Tammy and her husband, Billy, are two people that have become very near and dear to my heart. Had a wonderful time. One of the best hours of the year of 2023 was spent talking to the two of them here at the Mitsubishi Electric Classic. They are wonderful people. Before I get to Tammy, let's talk about our friends over at Squares Golf. And folks, do you sway and you're off balance in your golf swing? You know what? It could be your shoes. A golf shoe needs structure to provide stability and reduce sway. How can you tell if your shoes lack structure and are hurting your game? If you can hold your shoes by the toe and heel and twist it, toss it. Squares was designed for the perfect balance of structure and comfort. Isn't it time you tried Squares? Try the new Speed Bolt at squares.com. That's S-Q-A-I-R-Z dot com. Looking for the ultimate Myrtle Beach golf experience? Well, it's only a click away. Check out the two-play special at two of America's most awarded public golf courses, Caledonia Golf and Fish Club and True Blue Golf Club. They are low country masterpieces featuring two iconic Mike Strands designs. Play these two incredible courses for one great price. Visit CaledoniaGolfAndFishClub.com to learn more about the two-play special and book your tee time today. Again, that's CaledoniaGolfAndFishClub.com. All right, now making her next on the tee debut with me is Tammy Mayfair, Billy's lovely wife. One of the best moments for me in 2023 was getting to spend about an hour on the practice range at the Mitsubishi Electric Classic here in Atlanta, just talking with Billy and Tammy. They are two of the best people you'll meet anywhere. Tammy has had a fantastic career of her own. She was a junior golf prodigy. Her father, Art, was the first golf professional at Kicking Bird Golf Club in Edmonton, Oklahoma. By the time Tammy reached high school age, she was a top junior player in the state of Oklahoma. As a freshman in high school, she finished fourth in the Mid-State Conference Tournament. As a sophomore, she was the runner-up. And then in her junior year, she went out and won it. As a senior, she was never out of the top five in any of the tournaments around the state. In 1995, she was inducted into the Edmund Junior Golf Hall of Fame. She played her college golf at Arizona State from 1990 to 1993. She twice qualified to play in the U.S. Women's Amateur Championship. She finished runner-up in the 1992 Oklahoma State Amateur Championship after defeating the eight-time state champion in the quarterfinals. She's gone on to work for companies like the Karsten Manufacturing Corporation, CBS Sports, and for a time she was on Billy's bag as his caddy. And I couldn't be more excited. I get to spend some time with her this week here on Next on the T. Hey, Tammy, how are you, my friend? Thank you, Chris. Um, that was a pretty impressive introduction. I've never heard my resume uh, spoken back to me before. <laughs> Well, it's a pretty impressive <laughs> resume, by the way. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> I want to start at the beginning with you. Okay. I read you started playing golf at the age of five, more to hang out with your dad than for a love of the game at that age. And when you're five, how, how could you be in love with the game? But is right. that how it got started for you? That is exactly how it started. I think I pretty much was driving my mother nuts at home. <laughs> and uh, she said, that's it. You're You're on dad patrol. And dad would set me out at the golf course while he was working all day. And I was not allowed to have the hot dog with chili and cheese until I chipped one in on the green. Is that right? Yeah, that's pretty much <laughs> right. And so one particular moment, I pretty much remember not eating anything all day. Oh, and finally he came in and he didn't realize what he had done. And he said, all right, this is your last last chip let's go and i <laughs> chipped it in on my last one. Oh, so, oh good okay for now you. i can have the hot dog okay there it is <laughs> there it uh, is and um that's how my journey began and my dad being the um you know only public golf course in town in edmond oklahoma and opening and he was a very big advocate of golf not only junior golf but golf for women and he had the biggest women's program in the state for a long time. He was just big in promoting the game and how it could help everyone. And um, since I was the oldest of two girls, I'm sure I was the, the the token son and took up his game. And it was 
me and all the range rats playing golf. And um, that's how I came into the, the world of the game. I read that you competed in your first tournament at the age of nine. Is that when it's, the love started to come about for the game? <laughs> no, the love started at the end of the tournament when I finished dead last, but I won the biggest trophy. And uh, the trophy was about three and a half feet tall. Wow. And they gave it to the youngest entrant. And I didn't have to do a thing but show up. And that trophy was cool. And at nine <laughs> years old, when it's almost as tall as you are, I could have cared less, but I wanted more hardware. And so <laughs> that's when it started. Not the actual playing in the tournament, but that trophy. And I had that trophy for, I don't know, I want to say four or five years in the running as being the youngest entrant. I took it up until about 13 or 14. And then another young lady in the state came about, which at that time, that was fine because now I was in competitive mode. So it was different. Speaking of competitive mode, you became very prominent in the Oklahoma junior golf scene and a fixture at the top of leaderboards by the time you got to high school. Was that comfort and having played in all those tournaments, was that a key to you in high school, maybe getting a leg up on some of the other kids because you were already comfortable with tournament pressure? Yeah, it was just part of lifestyle at that point. And and I should say that although my father is a brilliant player and an even more brilliant teacher and he's competitive and knows the game, I want to say that probably my true competitiveness comes from my mother because nobody beats her at Scrabble. So, <laughs> you know, um, there's a <laughs> there's a family trend there. and. Um, yeah, I loved competing. I loved the win. I loved making the 60-foot putt from across the green just to get somebody's attention. It, it's a chemical rush, right? So, um, yeah, I learned to compete very early on. What was it like for you winning the conference championship as a junior? Um, I was probably pissed I didn't win it as a sophomore. So, <laughs> but I'm sensing a trend. Yeah, there, yeah, just a little bit. It, it, it has not diminished. It's probably gotten worse with age. <laughs> just on different levels. Um, but I think I probably put pressure on myself because I felt like it was expected. And um, we had, like I said, Oklahoma was, a, it was and still is a really neat state. And dad really jump-started a lot of women playing the game. And I was really pretty impressed with what you said. Patty Coatney was the woman that had won it for all those years straight. And my senior year when I beat her, um, for me, I didn't go on to win the title that year because I'd spent all my energy working on beating her because she was the match. And it was a good lesson learned because I I I took that on forward to college because she she was the one you had to beat and I never thought about going on any further. So my energy was tapped out and my energy was spent. And there but was still more golf to play? There was still more golf to play. And yeah. there always is, isn't there? Indeed. Mm -hmm. So Timmy, you gotta tell me, how does an Oklahoma girl decide to go play her college golf at Arizona State? It was the one cool place where my relative li relatives lived. Oh, otherwise okay. it was the cold state of Colorado or Kansas. And although my father said I could play anywhere, that didn't really work for my homespun, wonderful mother who said, nope, I really wanted to go play for UCLA. I had a bad itch to to go study um, movies and television with golf. And L.A., I think, uh, scared my mom a bit. And so God bless an aunt and uncle that lived in Phoenix, Arizona, and I came out to play for Linda Volstead at Arizona State. And God bless her for taking me on because they were the number one team in the country at the time. And I could tell you honestly um, that she took me on by grace, but she made me good. She made me better. And I am forever grateful for her allowing me to be part of that team. Yeah, so let's take that a step further because Arizona State had won the national championship in 1990 and both the men's and women's team 
were crazy good we, at the time. We were wicked. <laughs> <laughs> we were very much our own fraternity and sorority. And that particular team, we are still tight to this day. And you have to remember, so my freshman year was also Phil Mickelson's freshman year. So I played my four years with him. And his collegiate girlfriend, um, high school and collegiate girlfriend prior to Amy, um, came over with him and she played on the team and a very good golfer in her own right. So um, we had a very close-knit team, those, those two. Tammy, I want to skip ahead a little bit in your career. You, you talk about television a moment ago, and you got into the broadcast business. I know you spent some time working with our mutual friend, Keith Hirschlin. Over at the Golf Channel. Talk about uh, getting started there in the broadcasting business. Well, I was caddying for my dad. Dad was playing in the PGA Senior Championship, and I forget the year. I I forget the year. But at any rate, he was playing a practice round with Arnold Palmer. And Arnold and dad and Arnold's right-hand man, a gentleman named Ed C., they were all giving me a hard time going, what are you going to do when you're not going to caddy for your dad? And so I smart mouth back to Arnold and I said, well, you started the golf channel. Why don't you get me a job if you're so concerned about it? <laughs> and, wow. Oh, yeah, I was a little snot. And um, Ed, you know, they loved it. OK, they were pranksters and they loved the challenge. So they said, well, you'd actually have a have to come up with a resume. And I thought, you little twerps, I'm a you know, smart blonde female golfers have resumes too. And that's what I said when I sent them my resume in the mail, just as a like, you little turkey type attitude. And unbeknownst to me, two weeks later, after I mailed that letter, I got a call from a gentleman from the golf channel saying, um, how'd you know we had a position open? And I said, I'm, I'm sorry, who are you? And how'd you get my resume? And then both of us started putting things together. And I went, oh my gosh, Arnold sent my resume along <laughs> and I said, well, and the gentleman said, well, I'm not going to, uh, I need to send you out for an interview. And I went, okay. And I was actually getting ready to go, um, perhaps to, to accept a job with the LPGA running their junior go girls golf program. So I kind of put that on hold and went down and interviewed and started my career in television with the golf channel. And I started with golf central. And the gentleman, Jeff Himes, that hired me said, um, I need somebody who knows golf to come in here and learn writing. And I will teach you TV if you teach my staff golf. And I went, well, you got a deal, but it's going to cost you. <laughs> 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 but that's how we started. And I started off with Golf Central learning teleprompting and writing stories and recording and and I loved every bit of it and then finally I missed all of my people that I knew which were tournament players so I went out to work for Keith out on the road crew and everybody that um and all the tournaments that they did and Keith was wonderful but he told me he said listen you're gonna have to toughen up he said it's a predominantly all-male crew and are you ready for that and of course I didn't know what he meant at the time but I'm like heck yeah let's go and he taught me live TV, and I loved it. I loved working for him. Um, it was everything that I had been trained for. It's just I was on the other side of the TV camera. And live so, golf was fun. So let's talk about the, the toughen up part, because you broke through a lot of glass ceilings during your broadcast career. And, and getting guys to take direction from you, what was it like kind of breaking new ground and all of a sudden, in a male-dominated industry, getting them to do what you told them to do. Very difficult in the beginning. And I had to learn, you know, half of me came from my mother that said you had to be a lady. And the other half of me came from my dad, which was you play golf at a very high level, which I had no problem nor any intimidation whatsoever going and teeing it up from the male tees all the way back with men themselves. And then beating some of them. So the, I, I had an inner struggle. But if I wanted to succeed and not get fired inside that TV truck, and it's me and six guys, I had to learn to drop an F-bomb. And if I did run to any trouble, and there was a couple of times I did, I told the guys, let's go tee it up. And once I teed it up, and once I beat them, their attitude was a bit different inside the truck. 
but I had mm-hmm. a um, um <laughs> I had a rule within my family and friends that when I got off the road, I had a 24 period a 24 hour period where nobody was allowed to talk to me so I could come off of that different person that I was on the road because my mother didn't like my foul mouth. <laughs> and <laughs> But that foul mouth got their attention because I think something I shared with you before, uh, you know, guys, you'll say F you, they say F you back and the situation is done and over. If you said that to a female, she's going to remind you of that every day of her life and probably come back from the grave still (laughs) reminding you, okay? Guys are just different. And I had to learn that. And my dad taught me that. He pulled me aside one time when I called him crying and he said, you chosen an industry and a job that is male dominated so you're going to have to kind of act and keep emotion at the door he goes guys don't like that emotional crap and i had to learn that and i did really quick you got to work later on for cbs and you got to go down and and uh, be a part of the broadcast team at the masters what was it like being a part of that broadcast team at augusta national which wasn't always all that female friendly Heaven, just heaven from a golf standpoint, you know, that's the epitome of where you want to obtain. And I loved every bit of it. And was it male dominated? Yes. There were a few more females on the time in graphics um, there at Augusta, the crew. But, um, you know, I, I enjoyed every experience I had. And I think I told you of one, there were a couple of different, very specific Augusta stories. My first one, as CBS would tell me, when I got the job, I had a gentleman, I worked both NBC and CBS as an independent contractor, which meant I pretty much worked golf all year round. And by the time the West Coast swing ended with CBS, which ended, then you started back up with NBC and vice versa. And I got to Augusta and they don't mail your TV credentials in the mail because that's a very precious thing. And they protect that. So you you pick up your credential on site. And as it would have, on my first Augusta, my airplane was early and unheard of. But by gosh, it was still sunlight. And I bolted over to get that credential to maybe hopefully go peek around. But as it happened, the production manager had already already left for the day. So the security guard had told me, said, listen. There's it's a U-shaped gravel road where the TV compound is located, which is behind the par three course, which you will never see. It's very well dense and packed with trees. He said, so the one way that you came in, you need to do in a direct U-turn and go straight out. If you get caught on Augusta National property without your credential, CBS, um, you probably never work for us again. I go, listen, I'm golf savvy. I get it. Don't worry, I'm out of here. I'll see you tomorrow morning. So I get on the gravel path and I go to leave and the gravel keeps going and going and all of a sudden it hits pavement. And I said to myself, okay, something's wrong, but now there's a car behind me. So I kept going on this pavement and all of a sudden I am in the middle of the par three course. And I go, all I remember thinking is I'm so fired. I am so (laughs) I haven't even put one drop on television and I'm done, but I can't go anywhere because this car's behind me and there's water because it's the par three course. So I go up and I crescendo and now I'm actually on a cart path in the middle of Augusta National Golf Course. And I just remember thinking, I'm dead. I'm dead. I might (laughs) as well just get on the plane. So this car passes me. And I said, Tammy, get a grip. You're a golfer. You can find your way. And I was going to do a U-turn and go back. But now here comes another car and another cart. Now, this is Monday evening of the tournament, okay? So everybody is off property because the public leaves and there's nobody there. And I went, all right, you're just going to have to find your way out. You know how to find a driving range. Head toward that. And I'm heading down this road. And I make a left where I see a possible real road to get out. And sure enough, and I find myself driving right past Butler Cabin, right to the front of Augusta National, where those beautiful flowers are and the flagstick right in front of the clubhouse. And here comes the security guard. And I'm dead in the water. I'm dead. (laughs) So I said, well, 
I had my camera in the front seat because I was excited to take pictures. And I rolled down the window and I had about a thousand excuses going through my head. And he goes, hi, how you doing? And I said, oh, I'm lost. I'm just trying to find my way out. And he said, oh, honey, it's right down there as he points straight down Magnolia Lane. (laughs) And I went, oh, wow. Um, I said, "Okay." And he goes, well, I see your camera. Do you want me to take a picture of you? He said, wow, get out of the car here. I'll take your picture. And I guess he just assumed since I'm on the property with a car that I have a credential and I'm going in this little in my head. Do I get out? Do I stay in? Do I get out? Do I stay in? I go, well, if you're fired, let's get a picture. (laughs) Okay. so he took a picture. I stood there. I held the flag. It's one of my favorite pictures. And I go to get back in the car and I said, really, you want me to go right down Magnolia Lane? And he said, yeah. And good luck to your husband. Now, let me say that this was foreshadowing <laughs> because I'm not married at this time. Billy's not even close to on my radar, nor did I think I had a very specific vow never to marry a PGA Tour player. So, OK, you should never say never. But I got back in the car and I'm driving down Magnolia Lane at my first Augusta and I had the windows down and part of me wants to drive slow. to Yes. Moment, and the other part of me goes, get the hell out of here before you're fired. And they find (laughs) out what happened. So it's kind of like a a go fast and slow and go fast and slow. But I treasured my moment. I got to drive the car down Magnolia Lane. And I never told anybody at CBS. So if you're listening, CBS crew, it's okay. I'm not working for you now. So it's good. (laughs) Good. We're good. We're good. But I enjoyed my, my, had an experience. My particular job was set up in Butler Cabin. At that time, and I worked graphics. I worked uh, with people out on the golf course to verify scores on the hole before you, the public, gets to see them on TV. And it was a pretty special office to be in Butler Cabin. So I, no doubt, I was the person you had to come across before you were allowed in Butler Cabin. And my first person that came, and I was made very, I had very strict rules. So my first person that came in the door one day and he tries to bolt right in and bolt right past me. And I went, sorry, you can't do it. And he was kind of bullying me a little, which I found out later was on purpose. And finally, I just put my foot down and I said, sir, I love my job. I love working for CBS and you're not getting through here until you give me some information and I will deck you if I have to. (laughs) And he started laughing and he goes, okay, I guess you pass. And I said, well, what do you mean you pass? I pass. And he said, I'm head of security here at Augusta National. And this was a bit of a test. And I went, really? I go, well, now you're going to have to sit down because I have a whole lot of conversations. I said, how the heck did you get to be head of security? And he said, oh, I turned down um, running Homeland Security. And I said, I said, what do you mean? What, what, What Homeland Security? He goes, the only Homeland Security for the United States of america and i said you're here and he goes do you need to ask anything else and i went nope nope not (laughs) we're good we're good but that was my introduction to augusta so all of that on some level sounds kind of stressful um but talk to me about some of the stressful situations that you ran into whether it was at augusta national during the masters or otherwise doing a golf tournament where you had to sort of Make things up on the fly. <laughs> on the fly. And, and well, from done. a female, from a female point of view, um, very few people realize when you're sitting at home uh, watching on television uh, what we're doing in the TV truck. And being one of the few females, when it came to um, putting on majors, we're on air for six hours a day. So while you're enjoying commercials, I'm running to the porta potty. So I always had a tendency to dress up for majors. I mean, that was kind of my, you know, the neat experience, work experience. Those were our major deals, too. So everybody kind of thought I dressed up because it was a major. But in in fact, so and by dress, I'm I would wear a golf skirt or a skirt and a golf shirt. But that was more more for functionality, because people didn't realize that 30 second commercial is all I had to go to the run out of the truck, down the stairs, over to the porta potty, 
And women, well, we we sit, we don't stand, and it's a whole different different zipper issue. <laughs> so if I wear a skirt, I can get in and out of the porta potty a whole lot quicker than pants and zippers and tucking and issues. <laughs> so everybody used to give me a hard time about dressing up and I look back and it was all men that gave me a difficult time, probably because they didn't understand. It was really just a point of functionality. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. Do you miss it? Do you miss being in television production? I miss the live rush. Yes, I do. I love putting people on air and I love telling stories. And I worked for two or three, actually, with Keith at the Golf Channel, three very great and very different. Uh, producers. And what most people don't realize when you produce live TV and specifically live sports, golf is a completely different element because if you think about it, we are producer driven versus director driven. And what does that mean? The director decides which camera and camera angle to show. And the producer in golf is the one that usually tells the story. But with every other sport, there is only one ball to show. In tennis, it goes back and forth. In football, we go down the yardage line. In basketball, we go hoop to hoop. In baseball, we're around the thing. So it's just a matter of which camera angle you show in order to tell the story. In golf, there are 144 golf balls going on in the air at once. So now it's a matter of the producer telling the story. And it was always our job um, as an pro associate producer, and I hired 30 people each week, and I hired, put those 30 people with the 30 groups that I thought were going to be important to make a move. And it was their job to tell me which player in the group was hitting which shot at the time. And it was my job to tell the associate director sitting next to me, and he would either record the ones we weren't showing so whenever you as a viewer are at home and you hear an announcer say a moment ago, well, then, you know, it was a recorded shot because we can't show 144 balls at once. <laughs> <laughs> so let's switch gears a little bit. When did uh, you said Billy wasn't on your radar at that time? When did you and Billy cross paths? Well, we knew each we knew of each other in college because you couldn't go to Arizona State University and not know Billy Mayfair at that time. He was the number one prodigy, number one recruit. He was, um, although there were some brilliant, brilliant golfers that came before him, he, Billy was the first one to win the Haskins Award and the PAC um, uh, Pacific Coast Am, and then he won um, the Amateur and the Pub Links in the same years. So he was kind of the bomb. So we knew of him. And in fact, working in television, I went back to his Hall of Fame induction, or Arizona State University induction. And we, you know, like I said, we were a very tight knit sorority and fraternity. So I knew of him enough to say, hi, we were Sun Devils. And Sun Devils, we always had a motto, we took care of each other. Okay. Until this other guy named Phil Mickelson came along and, and he's the bomb. And so we all knew each other out. He came back on my radar when I was working for NBC Sports in 2006. He had been previously married to a lady named Tammy also. And when that divorce was done, he asked me out and I said, no. <laughs> and he said, why? And I went, ah, I just it wasn't, um, I didn't, he was divorced and I knew some things and I just didn't think that was a good idea. And he kept asking for dinner and I kept saying no. And one day I said yes to ice cream. And I always refer to that stinking ice cream sundae. <laughs> <laughs> and I lost an ice cream sundae. He bought me an ice cream sundae. There it is. <laughs> <laughs> and we began dating and we dated for a year. And then he proposed and here we are. Wow. Mm hmm. So at some point in your relationship, you discovered that Billy was on the autism spectrum. How long after you guys got together did you start to see some signs that made you think maybe Billy needs to get tested here? You know, um, I will share with you a little bit if you don't mind, but sure. I am in the process of writing a book about it. And in this book writing process, um, that's a very good question because there were signs along the way. And 
when you first run across these weird little stories or weird little incidents or quirky little comments, the challenge for me was there was some backstory. There was some backstory from Billy's prior marriage that clouded autism for me. So in the beginning, when we had what I now label as autistic meltdown, which means his brain is spinning and he cannot come up with an answer to your question. So it comes across to you and me as anger when actually he's not experiencing anger of emotion toward you or me. He's experiencing rage because his brain cannot answer your question in the time that you want it. Now, that's what I know now. I did not know that then. So it comes across as anger. And I just thought, well, he's angry with his ex-wife. He's anger. We had to file for full custody of uh, our son now, Max. And we had to, you know, we had ex-manager issues. There were all these different things from his past that clouded me realizing So once all of that was put to bed, I still had this anger and these issues coming up. And I went, what is all this? And as it happened, going through the beginning part, I had somebody on the golf course, because where else would it be for me, say, I think little Max was shell-shocked or could have what's called Asperger's. Now, what the heck is that? So I go home and Google it, and I went, okay, well, it's similar, but that's not what we have. But after this was all put to bed, I went back and revisited the Google, and I went, I, I think there's something there. But the illusion is, for me, and being this competitive person, this strong-willed person, um, I'm a fixer, I thought, well, I I don't want the public to know this is Billy's a public figure. I can deal with this myself. And that's that's a delusion. And it all came to a head when Billy was DQ'd. And for me, it's an illegal DQ. And that's a story for another day. But I made the decision that I couldn't do it by myself. And I had to have help. Not only help for Billy, but help for me. Because I didn't know how to translate his brain. And it's very much like one of us is talking Chinese and the other one's talking Russian. And you got to find a bridge. And it took me a while to do that. So how hard was it to convince Billy to go get tested? I had to threaten divorce. And I mean it literally. Um, And at first, because... He's in denial that anything is wrong with him, right? I'm the one with the problem. And I approached it that way. And I was okay with that because I'm secure enough in myself. And sometimes that can be a challenge for people. But I said, okay, you're right. I do have a problem. And I do. I did. I said, I am missing something. I don't understand. And until I have a roadmap of how your brain works, then I don't know how to move forward. So you either go take this test so it can help me or we've got to really revisit our relationship. And that did not go well with him. And I said, listen, Billy, it's off season. It doesn't matter what it says. It can be just us and it's either going to help or it's not. And I had tried different psychologists up to that point. I'd done a lot of reading on a lot of books. And I I had set and had many a crying night. And it took me to the edge for me before this point. So to think that I threatened divorce, I had come to a lot of answers and a lot of hurt to reach that point. And now, did I ever want to divorce him? No. But I had to threaten it to get his butt there. And, <laughs> and even when we got the results, um, he took he took the that five page report, crumpled it up, didn't read it, threw it in the trash. So I walked over to the trash can and I unwrinkled it and I laid it on his desk and I put something on it and I just left it there. And it stayed there for two weeks before he read it. 
which is a pattern I had already learned by default. With Billy, if I want to get something done, I have to plant a seed two weeks prior, give him two weeks to marinate on it, and then he'll get there. And what I learned is that autistic report validated that principle. So his brain just, and here's the trick. Here's the amazing part about that diagnosis. He may be slow getting to the answer because his neurons in his brain aren't connected. But when he gets to that answer, it is always 100% correct. And that's a pretty amazing fact. Yes, it is. It really is. And that's what I have learned about my Billy. He's actually kind of pretty brilliant. <laughs> don't don't let him listen to this podcast. <laughs> don't let him, don't let him any wife knows we don't want to give him any more leverage than we need. No doubt. But he actually really is brilliant. And it just takes him longer to answer it. That's all. And I learned too, the doctor told me half the time he cannot read my hit my face, my facial expressions. And I went, well, that explains some of his inquisitive looks sometimes. Hmm. And I went, really? He goes, it's a real thing. So when he looks at you, he he doesn't, it's a challenge for him. Now, we have since worked on some things, but um, in the beginning, I went, okay, now some things are making sense. He has to know. He, now, since this diagnosis, just when you get a diagnosis doesn't mean it's an end all and you have all your answers. It's just a beginning roadmap. And then it becomes an onion layer peel one at a time. I still learn things. But if anyone is listening to this, what I would tell them, if you're curious if they have it or not, start with the five senses. Because it's all happens to it all has to do with neurons in the brain and, and how they deal with things. And that's why it's called a spectrum. So Billy's hearing is pretty good, but I could tell you our, his son, our son, Maxwell, has bionic hearing. And in the beginning, as a child, he used to tell me all women yell. And again, I attributed that to his biological mom and, and her challenges. But what I found out later is at Christmas time, I wanted to get him a video game and I told Billy, I'm not sure if it, he told me it was Xbox or like the Wii or what I was supposed to get. And I'm not kidding you, Chris. The kid ran from across the other end of the room. There was no way. And he goes, Mom, it's Xbox. And I went, Billy, is your cell phone on? Is the intercom on in the house? How did you know to hear that? And that was my first clue. The kid has bionic hearing. Which sounds great because we attribute that to Lee Majors and the Bionic Man or Lindsay Wagner and the Bionic Woman. But when reality, it hurts, Max. It hurts to hear on that level. That high pitch hurts his head. Wow. So that's eyes. You have to think about, or I mean, that's ears. Then you have to think about their eyes, which you and I had a conversation about eyes. Yes and um, Billy and his putting. And we yes. talked about that. So let's talk about that for yes, a minute. Yes, please. Billy is known for his slicing his putt, right? And it's a very, very, all of his wins, he putted with that short putter and he sliced his putts. And he doesn't do it during his practice stroke, but when he gets over it. So if anybody's listening and has this, don't ever change the stroke and don't let anybody do it because it has to do with their eyes and what's called point convergence. And the easiest way to describe that is if you're sitting at one end of the table and you put a candle or a cup of coffee at the other end, both of your eyes come together and as one to create one image. But all we have to do is put our hand over one eye and then the cup at the end of the table moves one way or the other, depending on which eye. So when Billy is over his ball and he has a limit due to the autism, which is, I found out, a little common in autistic people, the muscles behind his eyes are twisted, which you cannot go surgically do anything about. 
But like any other muscle that you train as an athlete, we had to learn to do some exercises because it limits his peripheral vision. And at certain distances, it affects his point convergence. So when I had little Maxwell and he's struggling in school and I finally found, and it's a trick finding the right optometrist that will do this, but they do some vision therapy and they put, it looks like a pair of ski goggles with laser lights on their eyes and they have to read a paragraph. In this particular instance, the paragraph was about um, 70 words and Maxwell's number came up to be like 321, meaning he went over each word with his eyes three or four times before comprehending what word it was before going on to the next word, which the rest of us can read a word and go, okay, and keep reading the whole paragraph, but he has to go back over it three times. So you can see where that gets him in trouble with school. He knows what the word means. He knows what the paragraph means but it means it takes him three to four times longer to read it. And the teacher's already gone on to three or four paragraphs down the road. He's still back here at the first paragraph. So you put a, you put, it's called a Brock string and you put beads on a string and you tie half of the string to the wall and you hold the other string up to your nose. And depending on your distances and where your struggle is, what they told me with Maxwell, his worst distance was seven feet, meaning the doctor said, ask the teacher. He can be at the front row of the classroom or at the back row of the classroom. But in the middle at seven feet, he's going to have a hard time. And I sit there and went, wow. And then it hit me like a brick. What is Billy's worst putting stat? And because I work TV, and because I've learned how to do staff, I knew Billy's worst staff was seven feet. He can hit, he can, he can make a hole in one easier. And he's like third on tour with hole in ones. He is better at a distance from 180 yards or 200 yards than he is from 100 yards because of his eyes. So here I am at seven feet, meaning at eight feet, he'll make the putt. At six feet, he'll meet the putt, make the putt, but at seven feet, he has to stare at that hole a little longer so his eyes can come together as one and see where the hole actually is. Can you see where this might be a problem hiring yeah. at eight? Right. Right. So we do exercises for his eyes. Now, where that comes into play as a caddy, it's very difficult for me, number one, as a female, number two, as a wife, explaining to somebody that we may hire, listen, if you come into a par five, I'd rather have Billy go for it at 200 yards than to have the 50 or 100 yard chip. Because all of us attribute length is, you know, it's better to be long and have that short shot in. I would rather Billy be, uh, Billy does so much better at 200 yards. He will hit it closer from 200 yards because his brain can comprehend and see that spot where it lands easier from 200 yards than closer. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So as we work on that with caddies, you know, that's, that's a, that's an interesting and a hard sell sometimes, which is why probably I'm on back. I'm on the back. <laughs> <laughs> and listen, Chris, which... dude, I'm, I'm trying to get fired. If you know me, <laughs> I'm trying, I, I'm pulling all the wife crap I can, Chris. <laughs> I know, I know you've been out there caddying for Billy and it, but that's gotta be incredibly difficult because you can't just hand that off to just anybody. And to yeah. really understand the intricacies of not only playing the game of golf, but also how Billy sees the game of golf has got to be really hard. I have found it very challenging, yes. And the more I learn, the better it is for me and easier for me to explain. Because in the beginning, I didn't know either. 
And like I said, it's an, an I, you know, here, I'll tell you one. I just learned another one last dog. Billy, I can always count certain golf courses, and this was with any player, certain golf courses meet certain players' eyes, right? Phil mm-hmm. Mickelson, the left-hander, will play golf courses different than the right-handers. Billy always plays well on this Champions Tour event up in Canada. He loves the golf course. So I can usually always count on that being a really good check. And as the wife that has to pay the bills, I pay attention to those things. So I was on the bag this last August and sure shooting. He played very well the first day. And I I can't remember. We were third or fifth going into Saturday and sitting fifth or so after Saturday's round, the second round. And I am pretty pumped because we're going to have at worst a, a top 10 or even a top five. Maybe we play really great and we win the thing. So I am fired up going into Sunday. And he goes out and shoots 77. And I'm I'm beside myself. I'm on the bag. I'm trying every trick I can. I don't know what's going through his mind. I'm going through my all my autistic things I've learned. And I, I don't know what happened. And as it happens, Billy autistically does not like flying after a round of golf to fly home. But um, I pulled a wife move and we flew home Sunday night from Calgary back to Phoenix. And I call what I now have as an autistic psychologist and I call her and I go, listen, I don't know what happened. You got to get in his brain. I'm beside myself. And she said, let me slow you down. Have you gone through the basic things first? And I said, well, what the heck is that? She goes, let's go through the senses. Did he eat the same food? Yes. Autistic people are textile with touch. Did he wear the same golf clothes? Yes. All the tags are cut out of all of Billy's things, whether it's pants, socks, underwear, shirts, all tags are removed. Okay. So it's not touch. Did he sleep well? Yes, he did. He wears a CPAP machine for oxygen. Yes, all of this was good. She goes, okay, I want you to think about the simple things first. Call me back in 30 minutes. And I went, I, I, okay, fine. So I hung up, what the heck are simple things? I don't, I'm beside myself. So I share it with Billy, the simple things. And I'm supposed to tell you, we go through the senses, eyes, ears, nose, touch, mouth, you know, blah, blah, blah. And he looks at me, he goes, hold on. And he runs in the other room. And I'm like, what the heck? I figured it out. He yells from the bathroom. And I said, what'd you figure out? I had two contacts in my eyes. And I said, I beg your pardon? He said, that's why everything was blurry. I had two sets of contacts in. And I go, wait a minute, wait a minute. That means you didn't take them out Saturday night. We played golf. We got up in the morning. We played golf all day Sunday. We flew home. You slept Sunday night. We woke up all day on on Monday because I didn't talk to her until the afternoon. And if I wouldn't have talked to her and wouldn't have asked you this, you still wouldn't have realized you had two contacts in your eyes? He goes, yeah. And I go, well, why d- didn't you think to question why it was blurry? He goes, I just thought everybody saw it that way. Wow. And I called her back and she goes, okay, what was it? And I told her and she goes, what'd you learn from this? And I said, well, now I got to monitor his damn contact lens. <laughs> and she said, that is not what you learned. And I go, all right, what the hell did I learn? She said, you learned that he doesn't feel things like you feel things. And she said, does feeling have anything to do with golf? And I went, well, crap. Yes. (laughs) And I said, this is why the one thing we argue about when I caddy and he plays is the wind. She said, does it have anything? And I go, yeah, now I know. He can't feel the wind. Do you think that might be a problem playing professional golf? He can't feel the wind. Not like I do. Probably not like you do. And I just learned that a few months ago. Wow. My point is, 
And he doesn't know the difference. He does not know that I feel it. And that's the trick because they assume, like like you and I would, we all assume that when we look at the color red, that we all see the same color red. But Jack Nicholas is colorblind. Did you oh, know? My. Right, there you go. So we're going to look at things differently, aren't we? But yes. we don't know that. I just assume that you and I see the same thing. And so why wouldn't Billy think that? Yet, he doesn't. No kidding. Until you open up a conversation. So now we have a conversation. And now he and I say, I can feel the wind differently. And it's not just because I grew up in Oklahoma where there is wind. Okay. <laughs> yes. I can That's say. So now we have another caddy thing. I And we have. And then you have to put in place rules. So my rule is we always look at the weather app on our phone before we play golf. And I can say, hey, it's going to start from a direction from the south and go southeast, but somewhere two hours into it. So roughly when we make the turn, it's going to change and blow directly to the south and go the other direction. So when I'm out there and I'm at the turn somewhere around 9, 10, and 11, and I say, hey, the direction of the wind has changed, he'll believe me. Wow. Versus me just being the wife and going, no, it wasn't like that two holes ago. So if it was like that two holes ago and it was we were heading the same direction, it should be this way now. And I'd be like, well, but the wind has changed. Yeah. 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 So it's a thing. Yeah, it's a thing. It's a big thing. Yeah. So you, you got know, you must have a checklist a mile long for yeah, when I'm he's getting ready to go time. play. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like I said, there are times I want to get fired. Yeah. And I can understand because listen, I assure you as I sit here and I'm I'm not gonna name names, there are other players that I know are on the spectrum. And I know be and the reason I know that is because of what I've experienced now. And so you, you, they learn defense mechanisms and they learn ways to adapt, but they, they may or may not know why. So do you have to have on your checklist as he's getting ready to play now, can you see things clearly? Um, I, uh, yes. I, how many contacts do we get in? Cause he has daily contacts. So I make sure that we've gotten the contacts out the night before, both of them, and I want to see them. You wow. can't just tell me they're in the trash. You can't tell me they're in the sink. Yeah. I, I want to know. Yeah. Yeah. What an amazingly complicated world. Then, you know, I mean, you've got to manage it, and Billy's got to live with it. It just, yeah. it, you know, golf is a hard game as it is. Yeah, thanks. I don't need any extra help with that. Right. God, yeah, exactly. great. Yeah, let, let me just throw this on the tiller. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's yeah. Amazing stuff. Mm -hmm. But it also is what makes a lot of those super athletes who and what they are, because they have an extra ability to hyper focus more than the rest of us. So as much as I may say that is a challenge for me, Billy has taught me a great deal about how he thinks and how I've brought that into my game and hyper-focusing on one, one particular dot that I'm going to land that ball. And he's bettered me too. So as much as he may be the yin and I'm the yang, we work. Yeah. Right? I can choose to look at it. Listen, is it a struggle? Yeah. Are there days that I really hate it? Oh, yeah. Yeah. And and anybody who has experience with a, an adult relationship like this, because most people talk about autism, they talk about autistic children. But never did it dawn on me, you know, those autistic children, you know, they do grow up. <laughs> yes. They do grow up. Yes, they do. Mm-hmm. Tammy, just a couple more before I let you go. And you and Billy have created a wonderful foundation. Talk about the things you're doing through that foundation to help people understand and get the resources that they need for those that are going through the same things that you guys are. 
Absolutely. Well, we started this foundation because of what it started with me and what I was experiencing and for what I am known as the neurotypical in this neurodivergent relationship. That's what it's called, where one person is on the spectrum and the other person is neurotypical. And because what I found out when I went through this whole process is there is no help for me. There's no help for the other siblings that are not on the spectrum. There's no help for grandparents of a different generation that say, hey, just spank the kid and put him in time out. And that doesn't work with autism. And so there's no help educating the neurotypical person on how to deal with an adult on the spectrum. So that is our purpose of the foundation is to give help to all the others in the relationship. And don't get me wrong, we want to do some things and and translate back the autism to the neurotypical, but we want to predominantly be be there for all the others. And what I when we started this um and that's the challenge with autism because as I just shared in that story, I'm still learning it. So the foundation is not up and completely running like where I want it to be yet. So once we get our story of autism and my book completed, that will um, translate and facilitate the foundation. And I want to make sure now that when I move forward and say that foundation is a go, we're ready for everybody. Because what I've learned is not only am I not alone, it's really an epidemic. I've had so many people come and tell me, my husband, my son, we were in Palm Springs last year at the initial Champions Tour event at Mission Hills. And I had a 76-year-old woman come up to me and say, everything I've read about your husband is what I had. And I, I had no help because of my generation. I'm 76 years old. Who do I call? So I sat down with her and had a conversation and helped her find what's called a neuropsychologist because you have to get a specific one to get tested, not just a plain counselor, not a plain psychologist, a neuropsychologist or neuropsychiatrist, either way. And so I had to be, I learned a hard lesson very quick. I have to be prepared and I want to put together a whole um, reference source for people, no matter where they are across the country or world that they can call. And I'm not there yet. But I will be because that is our goal. We figured in order to find our lemonade out of this lemon that we've been given is to help others make it sweet. So we will will get there. So one more before I let you go, and I want to come back sort of full circle back to you. Okay. Because you got inducted into your hometown junior golf hall of fame. (laughs) What was that like for you? Well, it was pretty special considering that my father was the golf talk of the town and there were other PGA Tour professionals, um, you know, Doug Toole, Gil Morgan. um, There was Scott Verplank lived in, you know, so you've got Ryder Cuppers and and Gil Morgan who just, you know, slayed the champions. I mean, and, and to be in that category, I was kind of overwhelmed and. I don't know. I'm in a hall of fame. That's kind of cool. Yeah, it is. (laughs) And I never, I don't know. I don't really look about myself that way because I went on to college to play with all of these wonderful individuals who continue on with the game. And I was just one of many at that point. And I consider all my teammates hall of famers themselves, whether they are or not, because they, they advance you to the next level. And I want to keep growing. Tammy, you and Billy are absolutely two of my favorite people on this planet. I cherish the friendship I've been able to forge with both of you. I look forward to seeing you guys, hopefully, when you come back to the tournament this year. We are looking forward to another driving range chat. Indeed. So am I. <laughs> I... I beyond kindness, thank you for having me on. It's very different for a wife slash caddy slash I'm not sure all the other whatever titles you want to throw on but thank you for having me no thank you for taking time and being generous with your time 
with all the things you shared. I hope we get this privilege with you again soon because I know there's more stories out there to uh, to hear and more great things that you guys are going to do. And then obviously the, the great things you're doing along with Billy for, I guess, making you be on the bag for as long as you've been on the bag. <laughs> well, we'll see if we're still married here in Atlanta. No, <laughs> much love, my friend. Thank same, you. Same to you. Take care, Tammy. All the best to you and your Billy. We'll catch up soon. Very good, sir. That is the wonderful Tammy Mayfair, folks, a finer person on the planet you will not find. She was a fantastic player in her own right, a tremendous junior and college player, like I say, inducted into her hometown Junior Golf Hall of Fame, then went on to do great things in the television industry. She is one of the great ladies that broke those glass ceilings, that came into a male-dominated world and took charge. And like I'm sure she would tell you if, if we weren't on the air, she kicked ass and take and took names and did a great job while she was doing that. I think she would be great back together with with whether it's Keith Hirschlin or wh whatever uh, production company she would be with and make the broadcast infinitely better if she was a part of it. And like I say, I, I meant what I said in her intro and I meant what I said right there at the end. The hour that I got to spend with she and Billy last year was one of my favorite hours, not just of 2023, period. I just being able to talk to them and hear their stories and the things that they've gone through, many that she shared with us tonight, but other things as well that uh, I got to learn about um, just was fantastic. It was a great hour spent and, and I was a little sad when it was over, but I'm looking forward to doing it again this year. And like, like I say, you know, Billy's been on the show a few times. This is obviously the first time I've gotten to spend this time with Tammy as part of the show. I hope I get the privilege of not only spending another hour with them on the practice range, but getting them both back on the show again very soon. Like I say, two more wonderful people you will not find anywhere on the planet. All right, my friends, it is time for me to put a bow on this edition of Next on the T. I want to send out my sincere thanks again to Jim Everett, Kevin Roman, Russ Holden, and Tammy Mayfair for joining me this week. Scheduled to join me next week are, well, of course, Tom Patrick will lead things off just like he does every other week. Uh, he will be followed by one of the most decorated PGA professionals in our game, John Kennedy, who was one of the mentors for Tom as he was growing up. So really looking forward to having John as part of the game. Another one of the top instructors in our game, Martin Chuck, will be here as well. And then we'll round it out with New England golf writer Chris Mitchell. So it's going to be a fantastic show, folks. I hope you come back and be a part of it with us. Quick reminder that you can find this show available as a podcast just about anywhere. You get your podcast content. In particular, we're out there on the Pittsburgh Tribune review site. So just go to triplive.com, click on sports and then podcasts, and the show will be front and center for you there. You can also find it available on Good Pods, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Amazon Music, Audio Boom, Player.fm. And again, my sincere thanks to the folks over at Good Pods for making this show one of their recommended podcasts. So download their free app and stream your favorite podcast from your favorite device over there on Good Pods. But as always, most of all, my thanks to all of you for being the greatest supporters in the history of podcasts. I appreciate you all so very much. Until next week, hit them straight, my friends.